Hello and welcome to joining us today uh, for our How to Catch a Black Bass, Largemouth, Spotted, Smallmouth uh, from the Bank here in Oklahoma. Um, today we're going to pretty much be focusing on this time of year into the spring, into the summer. Uh, largemouth bass are America's top sport fish, so there is a ton to talk about. Uh, we're going to kind of break this up into... Uh, bass behavior so what bass are doing at this time of year as they go into their spawning cycle and then as they get into their post spawning cycle um there's lots of other bass information as far as summer fall winter patterns things like that and we'll hold asking anglers for those at a later date so this we really just kind of want to focus on this time of year and put everybody in the best possible position to catch black bass um at your local waters or if you take trips to go places um, so what we're going to do today with lures and bait selections is I've kind of have it broken down into just a few key categories so that we can separate these baits, um, and talk about them as they relate to how bass are looking for prey, um, at this time of year in what, uh, what bodies of water. So what is going to be their more prevalent prey sources? And then you as the angler with artificial lures, how uh, you look to take advantage of that at different times of year um, in order to up your catch rate, up your bite rate, hopefully uh, have a little bit more success. Maybe for some of you, get you that personal best fish, um, but definitely uh, help you maximize those fishing days. We know that everybody can't be out there 100% of the time. So what kind of key factors that you would look for on lakes or ponds or rivers that you may go to fish for bass at this time of year so that when you are out there or you're looking to plan a trip that you're maximizing as many of these factors as possible um, just to up the, the rate of success that you'll find. So we have our lure selections kind of broken down into a few categories. So the first one that we're going to go through is going to be our hard baits. So True hard baits being our crankbaits, our jerk baits, spoons, slabs, blades, those kind of baits. And then we'll go into more uh, of what I consider like hybrid hard soft baits, which are going to be our jigs, our bladed jigs, spinner baits, um, buzz baits. Then we'll discuss a little bit of top water, um, which for the most part is primarily going to be hard baits that are top water. And then we'll move into the bigger section of soft plastics that make up um, the biggest uh, majority of different selections that there is in bass fishing. Um, the reason why big retailers in the fishing industry like Bass Pro, Cabela's Academy, Atwoods, um, dick sporting goods your big local uh retailers walmart you know they're going to cover all of these different types of soft plastics so we'll go through those and kind of break those down into mini categories of what each soft plastic is trying to do and we will try to cram in as much as we can into two hours as always these uh webinars are meant to be conversational uh, we do them live so that you can ask questions as we go along you may have questions on the particular subject matter that we're covering as we're covering it or something might pop in your head because of what we're talking about, or you had a question um, already, put those in. We'll address them as we go. There's no need to wait till the end. Um, so anytime you have a question, throw them over into the chat bar and we'll address them as we go along. So with that, let's talk a little bit about black bass. Um, so black bass include largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, and spotted bass. The most prevalent of these three are going to be the largemouth bass in Oklahoma. They're going to exist in every body of water in the state. Spotted bass are going to be uh, kind of on the eastern and the southern half of the state uh, primarily. Uh, they are a native species, both small or uh, both largemouth and spotted bass, so northern strain largemouth um, and spotted bass were native to our creek and river systems. All of the bodies of water in Oklahoma are unnatural. They are impoundments of creeks and rivers, uh, so we don't have any natural lakes in the state. So all of our nat uh, native fish species are descendants of riverine species. So they adapted to live in prairie, Washita, Ozark streams throughout the state. And then as we impounded, a lot of those fish took advantage of the larger, safer water uh, that they could spread out in. And so now we 
find these species in abundance throughout the state. Smallmouth bass, we have a couple of different species, our own native Neosho strain, which can only be found in the Ozark watershed. So you're going to find that in northeastern and east central Oklahoma, and that is unique to us. Uh, they do not exist anywhere else in the world. And then a lot of our reservoirs back in the 70s and 80s were stocked fairly uh heavily with uh, what are considered northern strain smallmouth. Most people refer to them as Tennessee strain, and they are a smallmouth bass that is native to kind of the Mississippi, Ohio, Tennessee uh, river systems. And as impoundments were put on those rivers, they found that that strain really adapted well to living in a reservoir and they started to attain much greater sizes. So as a recreational sport fish, they were then transported across the country as a game fish um, in areas that they didn't exist for angler uh, recreation purposes. So um, this time of year, we're in early March, our water temperatures, we had a pretty mild winter. So our water temperatures are a lot higher than they would typically we would see at the beginning of March. We'd be looking at water temperatures, depending on where you're at in the state, in the northern part of the state, probably hovering down in the high 30s to low 40s and slowly creeping up. Um, we're coming up on uh, daylight savings time here. I think I believe that's this weekend. And as we skip forward in that light cycle, we get that extra hour of daylight in the afternoon that will start to increase those water temperatures. And that's kind of the key to kicking off um, the first of our warm water species that will begin their spawning cycle. Um, typically bass, especially largemouth bass, are going to be about fourth in line of our major game species that are spawning um, in the late winter, early spring. Uh, typically, we will see white bass and our walleye. Uh, they will be the first of those game species um, that will push up. They are more temperate species, so they handle lower water temperatures, and they're kind of used to being that early, low 50s, mid 50s type spawn. And then from there, we move into the crappie uh, and then into our largemouth bass, and that typically in Oklahoma is going to occur somewhere in April is usually the window. But March is big bass month in Oklahoma. 17 of the 20 top uh, weighted bass, largemouth bass that have ever been caught in Oklahoma were caught in the month of March. So this pre-spawn window right now is really an opportunity to get out there and catch some substantially sized fish. And then as we get into April and May, you just start catching more abundance of fish in a mixed bag of sizes. So with that, um, let's talk about where these bass are at right now. So this is primarily going to focus on largemouth bass. We just don't have enough time to go from each species. I'll We'll talk a little bit about spotted bass and smallmouth where relevant, but this is mainly geared for bank angling for largemouth bass. Um, so right now, largemouth bass are in their late pre-spawn period. So they are just, they were right in the heart of that. They're waiting for water temperatures to warm up a bit before they get a little bit more active. But bigger female fish right now have come out of that winter lull, water temperatures across the state, and most bodies of water are now in the 50s, which is going to start spurring a little bit of um, metabolic uh, advancement for these bass. Um, when they hit the winter, their uh, metabolic rate slows way down. Uh, they feed less often. They're looking for one big meal a day if they can get a hold of it. Uh, it's all about conserving calories versus expending calories. And that's true throughout the course of the year, but it's especially important in that cold water uh, when these fish are not very active. So it costs them a ton of calories in that cold water to go searching for food. So typically what we see is a lot of success with bigger baits in the winter um, fished very slowly. So you're either drop shotting, dead sticking, um, pre presenting vertical presentations. Bass are just really unwilling to give chase um, and that's really what bass are kind of known for. You get into the warmer weather and bass can be voracious feeders, like all sunfish species. Black bass are not a true bass. They're in the sunfish family. So they're in the same group as crappie, rock bass, and then all of the different sunfish species, red ear, bluegill, green sunfish being the primary ones in the state. Um, so they're really looking to take advantage of, you know, large prey sources that they can get a hold of. And that's going to vary depending on what type of body of water they're in. In a pond, that's probably going to be a bluegill. 
um, that's going to be a bluegill or maybe some bait uh, that's in there, like golden shiners, are in a lot of ponds, especially around central Oklahoma. Um, and these are big, caloric rich um, food sources for them. In the winter, we don't have the terrestrials, we don't have the frogs, the snakes, the bugs. Um, so they're very limited to either fish prey, which for bass is almost exclusively bluegill, um, especially in small bodies of water, city lakes, uh, neighborhood ponds, your private ponds, they're going to be predating heavily on bluegill. Um, if you don't have some type of other bait source, like a shiner or a fathead minnow that they might look to take advantage of in the bigger reservoirs or rivers, they, that's going to be crawfish. It, and a lot of it in the winter and the late winter is going to be shad die off. Um, we have prolific shad die offs in the winter time between both gizzard and threadfin populations and those largemouth bass take advantage of that as do some of the other big predators like blue catfish um it's an easy meal for them they don't have to work for them they just have to position themselves in areas where those shad are concentrated and they're going to wait for shad that are dying and fluttering and sinking and they'll take advantage of that so that brings us into kind of our first bait segment of uh, this course which is um, utilizing big vertical presentations, um, which is difficult from the bank. Uh, this is really when boat anglers get after it in the late winter months, end of February, early March, getting off into these drop off transition areas where bass are moving out of their wintering habitat in that deeper, more stable climate. So when we get into the winter months, the top level of the water is most susceptible to changes. So if we have a warm front come through that shallow uh, water, especially when it's a little bit turbid or dirty, uh, it's going to retain heat a little bit, bit better. It's going to warm up. And a lot of times at this time of year, you will see those predator fish on days where we have, you know, three, four days in a row in the seventies, maybe even eighties with big South winds on the North end of the water body where bait balls will go in to take advantage of that warmer water. But aside from that, these fish utilize the deeper water that is more climate controlled. Um, so it stays more stable, which keeps them more comfortable. And then as we get longer days, warmer water, they will start pushing out of that wintering habitat, which is what they're doing currently. And they're going to look for transition structure near their preferred spawning habitat. Um, preferred spawning habitat for bass species, um, in particular largemouth bass, is going to be shallow sheltered areas. That's going to be creeks, um, that's going to be coves, uh, marinas, anywhere where they can find water to build nests where there's not going to be a lot of disturbances, um, you know, open water waves or current. They're looking for still water um, with mixed bottom. They prefer to have sandy or gravelly bottom to spawn um, so that their eggs don't get silted in. Um, that's what the male does. The female will lay the eggs. She will get out. The male will fertilize the eggs and then he will aerate them by using his fan. So his uh, tail fin, he'll use that and they will clear the nest with that and they'll keep the eggs aerated and keep the silt off of them until they hatch. And then they'll provide some parental care to the fry. And then after a time, they'll move back out to that transition structure with the females once the spawning cycle is completed and we move into the post-spawn early summer patterns. So right now, if you're a bank angler and you're looking to get a hold of some of these larger fish, the bigger reservoirs probably aren't your best bet. It's going to be smaller impoundments where you can reach the deeper water on that transition area. That's going to be ponds. That's going to be city lakes, small impoundments. Um, and what you're looking for are obviously areas that have ideal spawning habitat and how you can access the main transition to get to that spawning habitat, which is usually big points ledges the dam um and uh and working baits somehow to those fish so live bait is a great uh thing at this time of year when you can keep that bait stable so casting a weight with a hook leaving it down on the bottom um if you can catch local prey source so if you can get a hold of a sunfish um catch a little bluegill catch a little hybrid sunfish a little green sunfish and tail hook them but keep them on a big, heavy weight so they can't go anywhere. They can just swim in circles. That's going to lead to some really big fish at this time of year, especially in those smaller bodies of water that you can cast to those transition areas. Again, if because you're limited with fishing from the bank and you can't just vertically sit over these fish and reach these deeper um, 
pockets of water with spoons or uh, with big hair jigs that are popular at this time of year for vertical presentations, your best bet is really taking advantage of either drop shotting um, a big profile bait and keeping a tight line, you know, days without a ton of wind are going to be more favorable for that type of fishing um, or throwing out a live bait uh, and waiting. That's, that's really what is kind of the game at this time of year. So we get into the next couple of weeks, light cycle gets a little bit longer, uh, water temperatures start to warm up. You're going to have a lot more access to um, these fish as they push up, spend a lot of time during the day up in shallower water looking to feed. They go into kind of a pre-spawn gorge like all species. Um, and that typically happens twice a year. It happens in the fall, right before winter, they're stocking up on reserves and it happens again right before they go into the major part of their spawn to beef up the calories, the females to make sure that their eggs are plenty viable and the males to build up a big caloric reserve because once they go into the spawning cycle, they're no longer eating or consuming baits. They are there to um, reproduce and then defend the nest, the eggs, the fry, and go through that entire process before they start actively feeding again. Um, and we'll talk about that with the soft plastics as we get a little bit farther in. So our first, I'm going to answer, well, let's look at this question before we get into the bait. I'm an urban angler in OKC. Where in the city would you suggest I target? So city lakes, um, some of the close to home areas that we have are going to have some decent sized bass in them. Um, neighborhood ponds that you might have access to. And then as we get a little bit further into the year, um, when we get to like the middle of April, Hefner can be a pretty good largemouth lake getting into the marinas where there's public access. Um, that shallow sheltered water produces some pretty decent bass each year for bank anglers. Um, but aside from that, um, as far as bank access goes, when you're in these urban areas, you're always going to find more substantially sized bass in smaller bodies of water, which are mostly going to be ponds. Um, you go out to a big reservoir, you're going to catch a mixed bag of bass. But when you go to smaller ponds or close to home areas, city lakes, uh, you have a much better opportunity of catching fish in that four to six pound range um, at this time of year, fishing from the bank. And then as we get into April, as, once we get into kind of the heart of the pre-spawn in early April, late March, just depending on where you're at in the state, then those bigger reservoirs, you're going to start to see a lot more substantially sized bass pushing up into that shallow water. But for bank anglers at this time of year, um, it's, you may get out there on a hot day where fish have pushed up and they're they're really taking advantage of some bait balls and you can get lucky that way but more often than not the bite's pretty slow for bank anglers at this time of year for bass um so first type of bait um is going to be these big vertical presentations that you could that you can use if you have access maybe like a big pier or fishing dock if you can get out to deeper water um and that's just going to be things that are going to be silver just like Shad, and you put this on heavy action equipment, 17 pound mono, 14 pound mono, big heavy action rods. And essentially you're just trying to target fish that are holding and you're just jigging these up and they'll erratically fall back down. And you're just trying to simulate your Shad dial. Um, <clears throat> that and big hair jigs. So like cast master spoons are going to kind of have that hair jig on the back of it. And then there's also just true hair jigs. Um, this is on the smaller end. This is only going to be a quarter of an ounce. Um, big bucktail jigs will run all the way up to like an ounce, an ounce and a half. But things that look like this. And essentially these are all you're trying to do in the winter months, the late winter months is just simulate that uh, Chad die off. And so accessing these fish in their wintering grounds or as they're pushing up onto deep transition structure, secondary points, things like that, you can locate them with the vertical presentation. Um, now, if you're going to use artificials and you're fishing from the bank and you can't you know, do that type of presentation for them, that's where the live bait comes into play. And then that's where drop shots come into play and utilizing floating soft plastic big lures, um, whites, chartreuses, things that are going to look like shad in the water that's a big bait profile. And that's kind of your best bet as a 
bank angler at this time of year if you're trying to locate some big fish. But we're really close. I mean, we're within a couple of weeks in most parts of the state of really seeing fish pushing up into that shallower transition structures, pushing their way back um, on the big reservoirs into their creek arms, um, getting off in those different arms of the lake, and then working their way back towards the shallowest part um, over the course of, depending on uh, weather, which usually at this time of year, you know, we're going to have these big swings like we do right now. We'll have some warm weather days, then we'll have a front push through. It'll cool down. And those cold patterns are getting warmer and warmer. Like we're at this week, we're in a cooling trend right now, but we're still in the, you know, high 40s, low 50s. Um, as opposed to a few weeks ago, those were in the 30s. So what we're really starting to look for with our warm water species is overnight lows in the 50s and 60s. Um, the more consistent that becomes, the quicker the water temperatures will remain stable in that shallow water as it warms. And that's really what's going to spur those fish to push back. Um, so as we get to that, so as we push into the next couple of weeks um, and you see those bass that are going to start pushing up on transition structure, which is going to be ledges, uh, river channels. They're going to use all of those to start to find the mouths of either the creeks, the inflow, or the coves, just depending on the lake, what it has. They're going to start positioning themselves to move down those lines, um, hitting that transition structure. Easy access from deep water to shallow water with structure mixed in between, more cover that there's in there. So brush piles, boulder fields, uh, woody debris, laydowns, standing timber, anything like that is going to concentrate more fish, the better habitat that there is. Um, like, sun, like most sunfish species, except for crappie that are uniquely adapted to school and suspend in open water, uh, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, spotted bass, they really relate to structure and cover. Um, the more cover, the more structure mixed together, the more fish there's going to be. That's what they really like to be. And they don't like to get out in that open water if they don't have to. They don't like to be in areas um, of, of no structure. So deep water flats, um, things like that. They're going to be looking for areas that have a lot of hiding places. They like to suck themselves in their ambush predators. So the more they can do with that um, and the more of those types of habitat that you can find, the better success that you're going to have. So as they begin to push up in that, they're going to start actively feeding. Um, and that's going to be dependent on what the prey source that's available to them. So on the bigger reservoirs, they're going to have different prey sources um, that are more abundantly available than they than there's going to be in city lakes or ponds or creeks or rivers. And really with creeks and rivers for bass fishing, that doesn't, that it takes place like a month after it starts to get good on your lakes. Uh, we really start to target large mouth, small mouth, spotted bass, um, for the masses where you start to have pretty good, reliable, consistent success is going to start in May. You can find big fish in March and April, but it's going to be a slow grind. Um, you're going to have to make a lot of casts, um, sometimes to the same spot over and over and over again, where you know that fish should be holding before you eventually get bit. As you get into May, June, July, you really see that bass activity pick up um, in our clear water streams, uh, in the Southern part of the state and on the Eastern part of the state. And that's going to be a mixed bag, depending on where you are of large mouth, small mouth and spotted bass. Um, but that typically takes place, um, in the heart of it starting a month later than it does on our lakes and reservoirs. Um, so in those bigger reservoir systems, they're, they're going to probably have three primary prey species, um, as we get into the later part of March, early April, that's going to be crayfish, that's going to be shad, and then that's going to be sunfishes that they're finding along um, transition structure out because sunfish, bluegill, red ear, green sunfish, they're going to utilize similar habitat to the bass. Um, they're going to look for a little bit deeper water. Not They won't go as far as the bass will go. On a big body of water, bass might go a couple of miles. Um, so if you have big long arms or creeks that come off of major reservoir systems like a Eufaula or a Grand or a Texoma, um, where you have these big, big branches that will go back for miles, some of those bass will have made it to the main lake in the winter, which means that they're trying to work their way back for several miles. Um, your sunfish 
your bluegill, your red ear, your green sunfish, they're not going to go that far. Um, they'll more than likely just look for good transition structure in and around that shallow water that they like to inhabit for most of the year. So typically the backs of coves, the mouth or the middle of the cove where you're in that deeper water, if there's brush rows, if the department has put out um, fish attractors or there's just natural structure, standing timber, that's where those sunfish are going to kind of winter and look to uh, get active as they go into their pre-spawn, which typically takes place around the time that the bass spawn is really at its peak. Um, they're going to be late April to early May spawners where our bass species are early April all the way through April into early May, just depending on water temperatures. Um, largemouth bass being so abundant, they're going to need uh, ideal spawning habitat where they can find it. So the smaller the body of water, the more bass that there are, the prolonged period of the spawn that there's going to be those fish. Some fish will go as early as they can. The second that water temperature hits where those eggs are viable, they're going. Other fish, they'll wait until the very high end of the temperature range for their eggs to be viable to lay. So that can create this window of spawning just depending on the body of water that could be two weeks long or it could be six weeks long, just depending on where you're at. <coughs> um, so what they're going to be looking for, where this is where you have kind of those fun big bites, is going to be with those hard baits, your lipless crankbaits, your jerk baits, and your build baits. This is really the time of year to take advantage of them as we're in the spring months. Um, when we get into the summer, we get into the spawn, post-spawn, we start to really slow down presentations. We start to pick apart areas. We're not doing as much search as we have to during the pre-spawn because when you're fishing from the bank you don't have the benefit of, of electronics so when you're out on the boat you have the electronics you can locate fish you can cast to the fish that you've marked when you're on the bank you're trying to pick off um, either recognizable or by viewing maps different types of structure along a shoreline or point and you're trying to cover as much water as possible, as quickly as possible to try to find pattern and concentrated fish. And the easiest way to do that is going to be with these hard baits. Um, this time of year, we have very limited vegetation outside of the far southeastern part of the state. So you're able to run these crankbaits and hard baits through that are going to have multiple treble hooks on them. You have a less likely chance of getting hung up in that grass, weeds, lily pads, all the things that become problematic for these hard baits once we get into the later spring and early summer months. Um, and then again, once you get into the fall fishing gorge, those hard baits really come back into play. Now with the advent of all this new technology and fishing and how that they're able to make baits, you know, replicate so lifelike, um, soft plastic swim baits have really kind of come in with those hard baits. Um, and just depending on the angler, you're going to get different responses from different people on what they really prefer to use as their search bait. Um, but the, this is really when you get to use those hard crankbaits and find a lot of success and get those really big hammered bites um, that have really made largemouth bass such a popular sport fish. So before I open up those boxes, I'm going to check the chat bar quickly. Um, Okay, looks like we're just talking to each other in the chat bar. All right, so with our crankbaits, you're going to have your two basic types of crankbaits. You're going to have your build baits or your lipped crankbaits, or you're going to have your lipless crankbaits, often referred to as rattle traps. Um, so I'll start with the lipless crankbaits. These are great search banks, baits for bank anglers. Um, there are really good build baits that you can use from the bank. Um, but the window for that and when you use them and where you use them uh, is a lot more condensed than using the lipless crankbait because the lipless crankbait, you control the depth by yourself. So depending on the lure size, so how much it weighs, typically most lipless crankbaits are going to come in an eighth ounce, quarter ounce, and half ounce. That's, those are going to be the three standard sizes. Um, so based on the amount of weight that you're throwing, how deep a water that you're casting to, how long you allow for that bait to sink before you engage your reel to start retrieving, and then how quickly you retrieve, so how fast you're spinning, how fast the gear ratio is on your reel, those are going to affect where that bait is in the water, but you're in control of all of that. 
when you're using a build bait, ones that are designed to get to certain depths at just a normal retrieve speed, um, you can keep them a little bit higher by slowing down the retrieve and you can obviously dive them a little bit deeper by speeding up that retrieve. But ultimately when you're fishing from the bank, you're fishing uphill. So you're standing here, you're casting out to deep water. Here is the bottom coming back to you. And when you've made that cast, it's great. You can dive that bait down, get it into the strike zone. But as it comes back to you, unless you are just very familiar with the build bait you're using and how it responds in the water, as well as the topography of the bottom um, where you're fishing at, where you know that, hey, I can crank it real hard those first 10, 15 reels. And then after that, I really got to allow that bait to float back up a little bit. Um, you're just going to be better off with that lipless crankbait. So as those fish really get close to the spawn, they're like right on the cusp of of going and dropping eggs and fertilizing eggs. That's when utilizing like your one to five foot shallow diving square bills are really going to come into play with hammering fish as they're pushing up onto the bank. Um, and those are baits that you can slow roll, keep them up off the bottom. But at this time, as we move into the next couple of weeks, those fish are still probably going to be in fairly deep water, especially in the bigger reservoir system. So um, lipless crankbaits, those are going to be your, your best bet. Um, and then, you know, right now, cast into that deeper water, the half ounce is going to make the most sense. And you're just looking for very basic patterns, something in a bluegill, something in a crayfish or something in a shad pattern. So that's going to be your reds. So this is a Bill Lewis original rattle trap. These are going to be kind of that football shaped, elongated, fairly narrow baits with a little bit of a pronounced head. And you're tied on here, that flat part of the bill or the non bill. So instead of a bill, you have this nice flat head that's going to take um, the water and that water is going to, it's going to drive it through it. They have little rattles in them. Um, and this is just going to stay on a real tight wobble. So just a basic crayfish pattern in red, especially if you're fishing central northern Oklahoma, a lot of dirtier water, um, that stained prairie river system. Going for reds, these are going to be a dynamite lure at this time of year. In March, as we move into late March, and those fish are pushing up, really good search bait in a red. Now, the other main manufacturer of lipless crankbaits is going to be Strike King, and their baits are going to be a not quite as symmetrical in the body. It's going to be a little bit wider on the head. And so this is a Strike King lip lipless crankbait versus a Bill Lewis. So just a little bit different sonic signature that they're going to give off, a little bit deeper body. So you're going to get a little bit wider wobble on this, a little bit tighter wobble on this. Both of them have their rattle balls inside to give off a vibration as well as a noise, little knocking sound. Um, you're stimulating those basses, their lateral line. So in water where, you know, clarity is very limited, those fish are really relying on their lateral line system to search out and get behind and on um, prey that goes by them. So very basic colors though. Here's kind of a thread fin pattern, that more bluish back with the chartreuse through the middle, light body, um, golden shiner, something like this. And then basic silver, blue back, black back. Those are going to be pretty productive baits. These are They'll be good search baits for you. If you're in the southeastern part of the state, far eastern part of the state where you have a lot clearer water, you might elect for some more vibrant colors, more flash to it. Um, the more light penetration that you get into the water, the more sunlight that everything gets, the brighter fish tend to be. Um, the more stain the water is, the lighter colors that fish tend to be. So when you're fishing that muddy water um, or that real turbid stained water, uh, utilizing patterns that kind of match the water color or are really light or real dark. So you're looking for like a black, a red, or a white. Um, that chartreuse and things like that where you don't have light penetration to give off that flashiness is going to be a little less effective. Um, so here's just the basic, can't go wrong with a silver, black back, basic gizzard chad, going to be in every major reservoir in the state. Um, so if I was to pick two at this time of year, it's going to be these half ounce guys 
casting these out around points, working as much water as I can. Um, and I'm able to control my depth. I can feel the bottom pretty good and you can raise these up and down. But if I had to pick two just of the colors, it's gonna be the basic silver for the gizzard chad and then just a red for your crayfish. Um, and that's what I'm gonna utilize. If you're in that Eastern part of the state, um, in that clear water, utilizing maybe a bluegill pattern where the fish can really kind of see that color and that pattern on that bait, something like that, that's gonna have more of that orange underbelly, chartreuse through the middle, darker colored backs, olives, blacks, really dark blues. You might find some success with that in that clear water. Um, and it's a good time of year right now that if you're in lakes that have temperate bass as well, maybe throw in something that's got a little chartreuse splash on it um, with that silver body. And you can pick up striped bass, hybrid striped bass, white bass at this time of year. Um, but these are going to be the two big winners as far as consistency for search baits is going to be just a basic red or that basic silver um, color pattern. <laughs> and then as those fish push up a little bit closer, as they work their way up that transition structure, you can start to size down. You can utilize these bait, um, same baits in the quarter ounce size or even an eighth ounce size as they push up really shallow. And these lipless crankbaits, especially the ones that are in the red color or the silver color in our stained water across the state, um, you're going to find a lot of multi-species action, especially on the eighth ounce one. You're going to find some crappie. You're going to find some white bass. You could even find like saw guy at this time of year if they're pushed up into those shallow coves. Um, so lipless crankbaits, really great, versatile bank angling lures. Um, if I was to pick just a per perfect um, multi-species all around bait to use, if you're just, you know, kind of a casual angler, hey, I want to go make some casts. I want to be actively engaged in angling. I want to be throwing out a bait. I want to be retrieving it. Um, you don't want to do the finesse or any baits that just require a lot of different technical um, aspects with either the line or how you're fishing it. Just a cast and retrieve, a one eighth ounce Bill Lewis uh, chrome with black back rattle trap. It's just really hard to beat that as far as the search bait goes. Um, you get so many good principles of it. You could also go with like a pre-molded storm eye shad and like an eighth ounce um, or a quarter ounce and throw that. It's just going to be a more lifelike, subtle presentation. You're not going to get all the bells and whistles of a hard bait that's got the rattle and the flash and all that. So those are going to be your two basic um, search baits, but we'll get into the swim baits as we get into the soft plastics. Um so that kind of brings us to our build baits next. And again, with build baits, you really just kind of got to know the bottom composition, how what you're getting yourself into when you're on that shoreline, when you're bank fishing, because you're going to be diving those baits um, into trouble as you're bringing them back to yourself. And with all hard baits, they're expensive. Um, most crankbaits, generic models like Bass Pro, if there's a popular lure style and you go to a Bass Pro, odds are Bass Pro has its own generic Bass Pro brand of the exact um, <clears throat> color, style. You know, it's just going to be a little, you know, there's going to be subtle differences, but for all intents and purposes, they're the same. But those are going to run somewhere between like three and five bucks. You know, if you're lucky, they'll have like bargain bins and stuff like that. But your main name brands, your Strike Kings, um, your bombers, your uh, Berkeley's, uh, Rapala, any of those major big brands, you're probably looking at somewhere between like $6.99 and $12.99 for hard bait. So getting out there fishing from the shoreline, you know, you don't want to be losing $9 baits cast after cast. So build baits, you really got to pick your spots, know the water, but they are very, very effective baits. I really like them in that kind of last week of the pre-spawn, um, late March, first week of April, you have a lot more fish that are up shallow. Um, you can run them, you can make casts kind of parallel with the bank, keep them in the strike zone out at about maybe like five, 10 feet off the bank, especially if you have like a shallow gradual drop out into deeper water and trying to run them through those as fish are pushing up to either make beds, maybe females are on the beds, dropping eggs, anything like that. As we start to get into that, that's where 
like square bill one to five foot divers are going to be really effective. Um, even in some ponds, if you don't have a lot of vegetation, you can get away with running a uh, crankbait. You might size down a little bit. You use one of the smaller models. Um, when you're out on the big water, you're looking at using medium to large size, um, of the bait profile with that just square, small bill, one to five foot diver. You start using the medium divers, the more rounded uh, bills or longer bills, and you're getting to where they're supposed to be in that eight to 12 foot range. Like I said, those are going to be great. Those first couple real cranks. But after that, you know, it's just kind of a maze of getting that bait back to you. Uh, but this is, this is, the box that I have for um, when we get into those times of year where I can run shallow when fish are basically beginning to spawn um, right in that week before pretty basic colors through here. A little bit of chartreuse our bluegill colors, shad patterns. Um, but if I'm fishing like smaller water ponds, city lakes where I know that uh, bluegill are the primary forage, or even if I'm fishing, um, bigger water, but I'm in areas where I know that there's likely to be a lot of sunfish that are going to make up a big portion of that, um, bass's diet. This is a, is a killer color scheme right here. This does a really, really good job of mimicking those bluegill with that purple back. Um, try to take some of the glare off of it. Sometimes with this webcam, they appear a lot brighter than they actually are, but Purple is always going to be a key color with bass, whether it be soft plastics or hard baits. Um, that little subtle kind of iridescent purple uh, as a dark back color of the lure um, is going to perform pretty well. And it's going to be consistent. You're going to find that across the state. That'll be a very consistent color pattern is something like this with that gold and then that purple with sometimes a little bit of orange. It just depends on the make and model of the bait. But this is a really good one, um, especially when you're in more of that shallow water where sunfish are going to make up a big portion of that fish's diet while it's back in that type of water. When you're out kind of fishing around the points, um, more when we're not quite as far along in the pre-spawn pattern, um, shad baits. So your whites, dark backs, um, chartreuse. These are a couple of my favorites. Dark back, chartreuse. This one's got the nice little shad spot, a little bit of red. And then this one's just straight black in chartreuse. Um, and then it's always good to, you know, good search baits, basic shad patterns, silver back, black back kind of like the lipless crankbait. Really can't go wrong throwing something like that around a big reservoir, especially if you're fishing near the dam. Big, rocky, riprap points um, that are going to congregate a lot of bait fish. Something in that is always going to find some success, but keeping it pretty basic. Your gizzard shad pattern, something with the chartreuse and dark back, and then some type of bluegill pattern. Those are going to find success more often than not. If you're just looking for one or two hard bait crankbaits that you can throw around. Those are going to be what you're looking for, but definitely as a bank angler, trying to utilize one to five foot square bills, loose wobbles. They tend not to dive straight down on you. So you can reel a little bit slower. And then at this time of year, when it is cooler, slowing it down and pausing. All of these build crankbaits, they're going to be floating baits. So when you cast them, they're going to sit on the top of the water and that bill sits in the water. And the second that you start to crank, the tension from the water causes that bait to dive. And then based on the length and the angle at which that bill is at, will determine how far that it can dive based on retrieve speed. Um, but those square bills are, are very effective. Um, let's see. If you're in the eastern half of the state, again, some lifelike baits in that clear water, you're going to find a lot more long ear sunfish over on the eastern half of the state. So something that's like this, pretty lifelike replica cater of uh, those long ear sunfish. So something like that in that clear water, but again, square bills, 
you're going to run into a lot more vegetation over on that side of the state, clear water, but using some of those more vibrant hard baits will find success more often than it will when you're in this real stained or turbid water in the central part of the state, northwestern part of the state, northern part of the state. We tend to get back into more clear water in the southwestern part of the state outside of a few lakes. Um, Another real good color scheme. Now this is a deep diver, but you can get this in not such a deep diver, but <laughs> kind of get the best of all worlds with this bait. We get that silver body with that shad patch on it, but we're also picking up a little bit of chartreuse through the middle and then that purple, the dark back. So this is a really good kind of multi species prey bait. Anytime I'm a big advocate of lures, and soft plastics that you can get the most imitation out of. Um, all we're trying to do in fishing by using artificial lures is replicate live bait that we're not using. Um, so the more live bait that fish predate on that you can mimic with one singular bait, the more opportunity there is to find more fish more often. Um, when you are using a, you know, lifelike, pumpkin seed, long ear sunfish, you're going to need to find fish that are either giving you a reactionary bite or are keying in on that prey source. When you use baits that are a crankbait that might make up a few different species of bait fish to fish in areas that are going to congregate that type of prey, you're going to up your success rate. The same thing goes with soft plastics, things like tubes, tubes that can be frogs or bait fish or crayfish. You're just getting a lot of imitation out of the same bait. So the more you can do with that, um, the more success you'll have. And then as you move into like really small water, um, I'll pull up our, I'll throw this over in the chat bar. So we'll talk about a this a little bit later, but here is our angler guide for kind of targeting smaller sized bass. If you want to catch like lots of fish, um, this, the guide that I just threw over in the chat bar lists kind of our top lakes in the state that have an overabundance of that eight to 14 inch fish that really need to be harvested. We just came out with a new bass rule this year that instead of having six fish with a minimum length requirement of 14 inches, we now have a six limit fish, only one of which can be over 16 inches. So we're promoting um, the catch and harvest of fish that are under 16 inches, but really primarily in that eight to 14 inch range, which on smaller bodies of water, similar size mouths, Bass can be stun become stunted just like crappie can um, when there's just too many mouths to feed. So harvest of bass on smaller bodies of water. Ponds, especially if you own your own pond, you're looking to create a trophy fishery, you need to be harvesting bass. Um, you particularly need to be harvesting up, you know, 20 to 35 pounds of fish uh, per acre each year. So if you have those 8 to 14 inch fish, you need to be ripping out, you know, if you're catching 12 inch fish that are averaging a half pound. You need to be pulling out your, you know, your six fish. Now if it's private water. You don't have a, a creel limit. So you can keep as many as you want a day. Um, but averaging out over the course of the spring, then again, in the fall, kind of doing some management, having some fish fries, um, inviting people over, especially if you got your own pond, getting kids out there catching these small bass. But um, the harvest of bass is a key management tool, especially on smaller bodies of water for producing trophy fisheries as far as you know, four plus pound bass. So when you are on those smaller bodies of water, ponds, city lakes, you might elect for kind of smaller crankbaits, things that you can keep, you know, in really shallow water. And that's going to be baits, crankbaits that are typically labeled as like panfish um, or crappie lures. And they're going to be effective for largemouth bass. These are going to be like one to two foot little divers. And you can run these, you know, along weed edges, uh, little drops, humps, points that are in ponds, small city lakes. Uh, basic colors, brown and black, um, shiner colors, bluegill colors. Uh, a lot of the ponds that I used to fish uh, when I lived in Edmond in a neighborhood, uh, they all had golden shiners in them. And so... This was a great little one for little bass. Perfect golden shiner replicator. Take the front treble hook off so you have less treble. Um, and then just have that rear. But these were like one to two foot divers. And 
you could really target those smaller bass. And the thing about bass uh, and with all fish species is you often hear the term big bait, big fish. Well, that is true. That is only true because only big fish can eat big baits. Um, small fish, there's a limit to what they can fit in their mouth. So the bigger that bait gets, you're eliminating those smaller fish, which I'm, I'm not that person. I'm not a, I'm won't throw those big baits very often, unless it's like a very unique situation. I'm always an advocate of quantity with quality mixed in. Nothing is preventing a large fish from eating a very small bait. If you put it right in front of that fish. Um, but you're ultimately going to get more bites. You're going to have more hookups, more landed fish per day. If you're sizing down your lure selection. Um, that's very important when you're fishing smaller bodies of water. When you're on those big reservoirs, um, you can size up a little bit, get into that medium class range. But instead of throwing that mega swim bait, that seven inch swim bait, that that largest size crankbait bait profile, that's going to be that four or five inch bait profile. Um, you are essentially making the decision if you're going to throw that that day you are only looking for a monster fish. Um, you are going to eliminate all the fish that may be in the area and you're specifically targeting a trophy fish. Um, and if that's your cup of tea, then great, go for it. Definitely use the, use what we, the colors we've just described and use the biggest possible version of it that you can find. But if you're just looking to get bit consistently, find a lot of fish. And this is the time of year that you're going to have those big, big fish that you really only get a chance at once a year. Um, you're still going to catch them on real small baits if you put it in front of them, um, especially as they start to get more active. But utilizing those lip crank baits and jerk baits that can suspend and rise a little bit, you can do a lot of, um, you know, some technical aspects of fishing them as opposed to just cranking them straight in. You'll find fish that way at this time of year. But if you can pause them, you know, a couple of quick cranks, let it sit. A couple of quick cranks, let it sit. A lot of times those strikes will come during the pause. That bait will stop on a dime and it'll slowly start to rise. That fish may have tailed it a little bit, but it's like, I'm not giving chase. When they're chasing live bait, they expect that bait to be evasive, which means they're going to have to expend more calories chasing this thing around to try to eat it. Um, so anytime that they can ambush, especially if you can find um, structure that you can see, logs, boulders, anything like that that's in the water where you know to pause it in those areas where there may be predator fish, you know, sitting in ambush, that's when you're going to come get struck is during that pause. So that pushes us into crank or uh, into jerk baits, which are meant to do just that. And for me, jerk baits, most effective pre-spawn fall gorge. Outside of that, I'm not using crank baits any other time of year or uh, jerk baits fishing from the bank any of our reser reservoirs or river systems. Um, this is when it makes the most sense targeting key pieces of structure, working that bait middle of the water column. They can be very effective if you can get them down deeper. Um, when those fish are kind of off into that wintering habitat, pushing up that transition, if you can cast to it and you maybe have a sinking, a slow sinking jerk bait that you can get out there and work it through the water, just like what uh, boat anglers are doing with a vertical presentation with a hair jig or a slab or a spoon. You can kind of get the same element of that by casting with a jerk bait. You can put it in that strike zone and leave it in that strike zone and allow those fish that are more lethargic to come um, take bites at them. I'm partial to uh, Rapala's Ripstop right now. I really like this bait. It's a good bait profile. Um, they have every color you can imagine. Um, but if I'm out there, I'm going to have four primary colors that I'm going to look to utilize with the ripstop. These are all, um, they come in a few different versions. You can get a suspending, a rising, or a falling. I typically go with the suspending. Um, but I have four basic colors that I like to use. If I'm in areas, especially if I'm in a pond where I know that I can fish these without getting hung up, going with the golden shiner, that dark gold back, gold through the middle, then a little lighter underbelly, some red on it. Real good one when I'm trying to mimic uh, golden shiners. And then when I'm in the big water, if I'm on a big reservoir, uh, 
Arcadia. I fish jerk baits a lot at Arcadia um, in the spring, in the fall. And the three colors that I really get after it with are going to be basic shad, black back, silver body, purple with a little bit. It's kind of, it's hard to see in here. It looks like it's silver, but it's more of kind of like an iridescent gold that goes through the body into a lighter bottom. And then our very flashy one, red head, chartreuse back, silver through the middle, iridescent, and then that chartreuse and red on the bottom. And I'll use those. Those will be the four colors that I utilize um, when I'm out fishing. And you basically can use these just like you would that um, square bill crankbait. You're fishing kind of in the same areas. With these, I can get them out a little bit deeper, um, especially if I put some split shot on them drag them a little bit farther down on the water. They're suspending. That split shot is going to allow for a very slow sink rate. So I'm getting a lot of that shad die off action by jerking it, jerking it through the water, get the pause. And then with that split shot about a foot out ahead of that jerk bait, it's going to just kind of pull that bait down as it pauses. Um, but again, I try to fish them right in that real golden window, right before the fish are spawning you can typically find them up in fairly accessible water where you don't need to put on that split shot to get out to deeper areas. Um, and just, you know, you can straight crank them in. I mean, it's just, it's got that little lip. It's not going to get very far below the bottom uh, of the surface and you can just slowly crank them and it's going to have just a very subtle wobble um, or you can pop them and pause them, pop them and pause them. But jerk baits, very effective typically keep you up off the bottom. So like a lipless crankbait, you can control the depth a lot better than you can with build baits that are going to die. So with that, about an hour in here, uh, that really brings us through all of our true hard baits. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about top water. You're not going to get that top water action at this time of year. Um, that's really kind of post spawn pattern as we move into the early summer months late spring you're going to start to see some top water action top water action increases throughout the course of the summer because by throwing top water we're mimicking a lot of terrestrial activity which is going to be lizards frogs snakes ducks um, bait fish that are dying as a result of low oxygen sunfish <clears throat> during those warmer weather patterns in the summer in the early morning late evening they're going to push up right on the surface, eating, surfacing, hatching bugs, things like that. Great time for top water. But this time of year, um, March, basically all of March, hard baits are going to be very effective for bank anglers. You can utilize soft plastics and we'll get into that, but soft plastics for bank anglers really start to come alive as we get into the heart of the spawn. Um, and I'll get into that. Um, I'm on Grand Lake, so it's not on that list. Yeah, so Grand Lake has a very good bass population. Uh, we're not that worried about population control on it. Uh, most of those lakes that are listed in that uh, bass angler guide for catching smaller sized, more abundant fish are going to be smaller impoundments because that's where the stunting and harvest is much more important. Bigger reservoir systems might have problem areas in pockets of the lake depending on fishing pressure things like that but big huge reservoirs are very self-sustained ecosystems that with or without angling pressure are going to kind of take care of themselves we don't run into stunting issues on big reservoirs like we do small impoundments largemouth bass typically tend to be the apex predator in smaller bodies of water they're going to outcompete channel catfish. They're going to be more active. They're going to decimate the bait population a lot quicker. And in smaller bodies of water, the bait selection is a lot more limited. Bigger reservoirs, lots of bait, lots of different types of prey on different parts of the water body. Ecosystem takes care of itself. So our top water baits, what we're looking for when we get into late April, early, all of May into June. And then as we get into the late summer months, mornings and evenings are going to be the most effective. That water's just too hot. Unless you find shaded areas um, of maybe some cooler water pockets, maybe there's a spring creek that comes in somewhere, a little bit colder water temperatures where those fish will like to sit up in those shallow covered areas. Um, most of the time you're just looking to to target shorelines, um, running baits parallel. When you're on the big water, 
big reservoirs fishing from the bank. Um, you you can utilize a lot of the bigger topwater lures, the more active topwater lures, things like uh, propeller baits. So like a Whopper Plopper or the Berkeley Chopo. So here's one of those Berkeley Chopos. These come in a few different sizes. They have the rotating wheel on the back. These are super easy to fish. Cast them out, straight retrieve them. It'll kick that wheel around on the back, create that gurgling action, and you can get some really big blow-ups. Um, fishing ponds that have those golden shiners in them, great bait, perfect golden shiner replicator, putting that right up on the top of the water. Really like the Whopper or these Berkeley Choppos or the Whopper Ploppers, things that have the propeller on the back. These are an advanced step up from the old Heaton torpedoes that have the little blade on them to create that gurgling action. This is just creating a little bit more disruption with a more lifelike bait profile, but these are also effective. These are particularly effective when you're fishing like creeks and rivers. Um, you'll get a lot of usage out of walk the dog lures, propeller lures when you're fishing in that moving water, when you're on the still water of a big reservoir or lake. Um, the big spinning choppos or whopper ploppers propeller baits you're going to get a lot of success out of that you might get some multi-species blow-ups with those hybrid striped bass white bass striped bass um, just depending on what type of water body you're on now for the most part when you're fishing for largemouth bass with that top water keep it a little bit more subtle especially if you're fishing small bodies of water um, that's where your hollow bodied frogs are going to come in handy when you get that big vegetative growth as we get later into the spring early summer weed lines come back native water vegetation starts to fill in utilizing things that are not going to get snagged as often um, but do require a little bit more attention to your hook set. So your basic little Kermie frogs with their little string tails, hollow body float. They have the double hook point up at the top. So when that fish bites on it, it clamps this down, but sometimes through no fault of your own, they hit these things in hard or weird ways that will remove the, can move that, hollow body around and you don't get a good hook set on it, especially the ones where the hook point can kind of come free from the eye hole. These Kermy frogs are good because it's one solid hook back to the two points. So they're from the eye hole all the way back. It's one connected piece, but anytime you're fishing top water, it's exciting. You get that visual blow up. You see that fish come get that bait. You really got to allow for that fish to grab the bait, go subsurface before you try to set the hook. If they come up and you're setting the hook the second the thing comes out of the water, it's kind of a 50-50 chance that you pull in that free of the fish's mouth before it had an opportunity to get it. Sometimes they'll miss it. You'll be working a like a walk the dog type lure or a hollow body frog, and they'll come up and they'll take a swing at it, and they'll miss it, and you can leave it there and then twitch it again and then come back and get it again. So allowing for the fish to grab any type of top water, take it back under, it's difficult. I mean, you get excited when you get that big blow up, but something to keep in mind when you're fishing topwater, telling yourself, when I see that fish come up, allow them to take the bait so you can get a really good hook set to come in. Um, and when you're fishing like the hollow bodied frogs, especially around heavy vegetation, pairing it with some braided line, 30 pound braided line, 50 pound braided line, um, if, especially with lily pads, things that are you're not going to be able to get through, even with 10, 12, 14 pound mono, still susceptible to losing the fish or breaking your line. Anytime you're using the, the uh, kind of weedless style uh, topwater baits, braided line is going to be your best friend. Um, and then we have just your kind of basic all around topwater. Um, the one real killer on ponds is going to be a black jitterbug. Small city lakes and ponds this is going to be your one of your best friends for a topwater lure. It's just a little wake bait. So you tie on right here. It's got this big front that creates a quiet kind of gurgle through the water. Does it, This pretty much imitates anything that's on the surface. Could be a bluegill, could be a lizard, could be a snake, you know, could be a little frog. Dark body, um, small profile. They, these come in a few different sizes. But the medium one, these are dynamite when you get on ponds, small city lakes, when you get that 
good topwater bites starting in the late spring, early summer. Jitterbugs are, are a top topwater lure. Um, when you're on the bigger water, lots of different species, you could get a lot of different things to come up. Then you start running into, you know, like rattle frogs, something that's going to make a lot of noise on the surface, but still kind of has subtle movement through the water. If you're fishing like rocky shorelines, things that don't have a lot of vegetation where you can get those treble hooks, subsurface, not going to get hung up on things. Um, and then your poppers. So pencil poppers, um, hula poppers, chug and plugs. There's such an assortment, different baits, different brands that are going to have kind of a concave mouth on them where the eye hole is at. Trebles, some of them are going to have tails on them. Some of them aren't. And these are just basic big reel handle turn to get it to move or a rod pop. Um, if you're using spinning equipment and you sometimes struggle with line twist or with bird's nests that come off of that reel, instead of popping it with the rod tip, creating slack and then picking up the slack, use the reel handle, just a quick turn and it'll pop it for you, especially if you keep that rod tip up. Um, anything that's parallel with the water or up with the reel, it's gonna pop it. Same thing with the walk the dog type lure. Instead of really hitting both sides of it, if you're not using a casting reel, where it's picking up line straight in front of it so you don't get the twists or the bird's nest. If you're using spinning, open face spinning reels to utilize any type of top water, you really kind of want to use your reel handle to get any of the additional action that the lure may offer um, instead of popping the rod tip because that's just going to create slack in the line. And depending on the rod class and the line class and the weight of the lure, those three things are going to affect how much slack is there in memory that's in the line, especially if you're using monofilament and it's going to pick up and more than likely you might get a twist that twist will be in the spool. You don't notice it. You've reeled all the way up. You go to cast. That line tries to get around the twist, and it pulls three different strands of line up, and that's where you get that nasty bird's nest out of. And that's that That happens a lot with topwater lures. Um, in other cases, if you're using spinning equipment and you're, that's happening to you, almost 90, 95% of the time, that problem is caused the lure you are throwing or the line that is on the reel Paired with the lure that's too light, you have too heavy a line, too light a lure. The rod can't handle either. So when you go to cast, it's just the line is popping right off. So always paying attention to your reel and your rod, and they will tell you what the line class and the weight class of the lure should be because that's what they're there for. They're telling you this is the optimal range. And typically when you get that line lash on spinning equipment, it's because the lure is too light, the line's too heavy, and then a combination of the rod can't handle it either. Usually the rod's too stiff. It's usually a heavy action, medium, heavy action rod. Too, too much line, 12, 14, 17 pound test using an eight ounce lure, 16 ounce lure. Can't throw it, doesn't load the rod tip. When you go to throw it, pulls that line straight off. All right, so that moves us through all of our hard baits and we have about an hour to go. So now we're gonna do the hybrid type baits and then into our soft plastics. So our hybrid baits are gonna also be effective at this time of year as we're moving into that pre-spawn period, like the uh, crankbaits and our jerk baits. They're mimicking similar style of prey species. The one difference being is typically with these types of baits, you're reeling them a little bit faster. Um, you don't, the, the control that you need, aside from maybe just a jig, like a little swim jig or a football head jig, your bladed jigs, in order to get them to work effectively, you need to continue to reel, which is going to be moving that bait through the water. Spinner baits that are going to have that blade that needs to keep moving. So that's also going to affect how fast it's moving through the water. And then buzz baits, which are kind of a pseudo top water, half the baits on top. And then the trailer and the skirt are subsurface. So you're creating that surface disruption, like fish feeding on bait fish or bait fish disturbances on the water. And then your trailer and your skirt are just subsurface. And that's what the fish is keying in on to come after. Um, so these baits are going to become more effective as we get a little bit later into the winter. It's not to say, um, you know, you'll see a lot of boat anglers working docks marinas, backs of coves right now, looking for fish on those warmer days that have pushed up, utilizing some of that cover. And they'll be throwing big spinner baits, big Alabama rigs. Um, 
and sometimes buzz baits, you know, if it's early morning, late evening, they may be working a buzz bait at this time of year. And then the uh, lipped or the bladed uh, jigs, commonly referred to as chatter baits, um, those are going to be those big profile baits targeting big fish at this time of year. Um, but they're a little bit more effective for boat anglers earlier in the season, fishing deeper water. You're fishing from a vertical presentation. You're fishing downhill or at least parallel with the bottom. It allows you to go a little bit slower. You don't have that benefit when you're fishing from the bank. You're fishing uphill. In most cases, there's going to be a lot of debris that's going to be closer in that shallower water. So when we get flooding, lake level rises, all of that woody debris, things that float down, that's going to get pushed up against the banks as that water recedes, leaves that structure there, water fills back up over the top of it. It's now become waterlogged. It's now part of the bottom structure. That's gonna be most prevalent near shore. So when you're utilizing any type of bait, especially ones that you're trying to fish slow or fish near the bottom, um, you're just gonna run into those hangups more often. But as we get a little bit later, we kind of hit that perfect window of water temp, versus where we're at in the pre-spawn cycle. And that typically opens up a two week window where you can really get away with the entire playbook of both hard baits and these hybrid baits worked at a medium pace. Fish metabolic rates have sped up. They're looking to gorge. They really start to go after bait. So you can pick up that retrieve speed with the spinner bait to keep it up off the bottom, but still keep the blade moving. Same thing with the bladed jigs. Um, with the spinner baits, we're really just going for reaction. That's kind of like an Alabama rig. We're creating a bait ball, um, lots of action that's on it. You're getting the vibration. You're getting the pulse of the skirt. Most of them are paired with big trailers, especially these days, swim baits, um, soft plastic ribbed paddle tail swim baits. You get so much action with these baits. Um, we kind of started with the soft plastic swim bait. Um, your fluke, uh, paddle tail, solid body, no ribs, very basic, and then a paddle tail or just the split tail, throw that on, let the spinner blade or the um, blade of the front of the bladed jig do all the vibrating, flash, get that attracted, and then have a lifelike bait trailer that's behind it. The pulsing of the skirt, like the pectoral fins, that uh, paddle tail kicking, just creating those subtle vibrations. So you've attracted the fish with the flash and the noise, and then you've ultimately got them to strike because of the lifelike presentation of that soft plastic, which is that hybridization of a hard bait and the soft plastic. But now we've really moved in to ribbed uh, paddle tail baits. With these, you won't find them in the big plastic bags like you will most soft plastic swim baits that are meant to be trailered. They will come in a package of five, seven, sometimes a dozen, depending on the size. Every brand has these now. There's specialty brands that just, you know, are making these swim baits, but they the big thing is the ribbing along it in addition to having the paddle tail. And what the ribbing is doing is creating that sonic signature, very subtle pulsing that those bass with their lateral, lateral lines key in on. But this is a great color. Um, that blue kind of lightest gray color mixed with that chartreuse, a little bit of flash through it. This is a very good color scheme statewide. You get a lot of value out of that gray bluish back, a lot like a shad, but could also be a bluegill, other minnows or bait fish that are in the water. And then just kind of that subtle iridescent chartreuse with a little bit of flash so from a trailer perspective putting pairing something like this with um just your basic color spinner bait so your chartreuse your white something with maybe like a black back or a blue back um here's some very generic half ounce spinner bait models here's we've got the We've got a little Colorado blade on it, which are going to be these fat round ones, kind of like a teardrop shape, but not so much more rounded. And then our willow blade, which is that big elongated. So two different sonic signatures, blue back, just like a shad or a bait fish, some speckling through white, and you can pair that right up in there. And with these 
most spinner baits, um, some of them will have a collar. Some of them won't. This one doesn't have a collar. So when you'd put this on, some people will do this before they put the bait on to kind of see where that hook turn is on the back. The more you do it, it just kind of becomes second nature. But you want to go in through the head of your swim bait. Make sure that that boot tail or paddle tail is face down. So that flat part of the bait is what the hook point is going to come through. And that deeper body side with the downside of the paddle tail is face downward. And with any trailer hook, sometimes there will be a longer shank. This is a fairly short shank, so you won't only want to utilize a bait that you always want to be at least halfway back on the body because the fish has got to get up and over the hook. Um, so the farther that you put the hook towards the front of the bait, the more short strikes you can get, which is the fish grabbing the back end of the bait, but it doesn't get over the hook point and ultimately you miss the fish, even though it bit because it didn't hit the, didn't get up over the hook, but it's just a real good subtle blend into just about any color. So you can get away with it in white. You can get away with it with a darker color, um, chartreuse. It's just going to be this color and this style of swim bait is increasingly popular and it can pick up some really good fish at this time of year. So when you're looking for a soft plastic trailer to pair, with a spinner bait, with a buzz bait. Um, there's a big dual exhaust buzz bait right here. Dark body or a light body. It's got that rear treble trailer on it. Um, so for this one, you know, you're not going to really, you can put a trailer on it. You can put it off the back hook. All of all the brands, they're just going to be a little bit different. And then you can kind of tailor them to your liking. Here's one basic single blade. It allows on this buzz bait, it has the eye hole of where we have our trailer, our skirt and trailer connected. It allows it to free. So it gives it a lot more action in the water. But this has just got a chartreuse fluke mixed with that chartreuse and white buzz bait but this would also be a great trailer to put on with it as well. And that's kind of what you're looking for with any of these, any of these baits, um, especially at this time of year where we're really trying to key in on them really gorging on bait fish and shad, shad die offs. That's what you're looking for at this time of year. Um, and then we'll move into our other hybrid baits, which are going to be our, Swim jigs, football head jigs. There's so many different type of jig heads that you can use them in a lot of different ways. Um, but at this time of year, you're more apt to go with the bladed swim jig as opposed to just a skirted jig. Getting that little extra action in there. So here's a box full of an assortment of um, bladed jigs and with these you're going to have your reactionary colors those whites and chartreuses um which i'm always a fan of going with the more natural colors um i'm a big fan of green pumpkin as a base of just about any type of skirt or soft plastic if that's my color base that's what i have the most confidence in um, traditionally black and blue is a pretty universally renowned, uh, base color scheme for largemouth bass. Um, I'm just more partial to the bluegill imitators. Uh, so your green pumpkins, it just does a nice job of getting a lot out of it. Uh, with black and blue, I feel like I'm kind of limiting myself to a prey source. Whereas with that green pumpkin, it could be a frog, it could be a crayfish, it could be a bait fish, could be a bluegill. Um, I just get a lot of value out of uh, that green pumpkin as a base. And with these swim baits, crawfish, brush hogs, um, your bladed jig is a real good multi-tool, especially at this time of year. Um, those fish are pushing up out of that deeper water, up those transition zones. Your hook point is on the top. 
your jig head is on the bottom, your blade is moving, protecting your hook point as it's pulsating through the water. So you can drag these down along the bottom. Um, a lot of times it's effective to work them up the rocks. You'll feel that jig head hitting it as it goes up or keeping them in the bottom third of the water column. Uh, you can work this through grass, especially if you're using braided line on the end, it's going to cut right through grass. You're going to get that nice um, pulsing action with it. But pre-spawn, as far as the hybrid baits go, if I was to pick between bank fishing with a spinner bait or a bladed jig, I'm taking a bladed jig any day of the week. Um, very versatile. And like I said, I'm partial to just a green pumpkin or a bluegill green pumpkin, different brands, label them differently. The most common bladed jigs you're going to find in any Ma and Pa or big box retailer are going to be Z-Man chatterbaits that they're just, they kind of started the craze of the bladed jig and really perfected it. Now you have some specialty makers, but for the most part, these are going to be those original chatterbaits. Um, this is more of a mini one. These are great for ponds. The ones that are eighth ounce or smaller, eighth ounce or bigger are great for the river systems, big rivers, um, big reservoir systems. But what you throw on as a trailer, I typically try to match fairly closely the base color of the trailer with the skirt. Um, I'm just trying to keep a natural presentation as opposed to that big flashy, something like this with a big bright trailer on it to get that reactionary bite. Um, that's just not what I have confidence in as far as bass fishing from the bank. I have more success using those natural colors. Um, so this is kind of my go-to is that bluegill base or that green pumpkin base. And then just depending on how I'm going to fish it. So if I'm trying to bang this thing on the bottom, I'm probably going to elect to have more of the crawfish trailer, something with the appendages, either a crawfish trailer or a brush hog. Um, are going to be my trailers. If I'm fishing it more up in the water column, trying to bring it middle of the water column, fishing it parallel with the bank, I'm going to elect for something with a bumper tail on the back of it, something in this light color or something that's in a straight green pumpkin, red and black flake, bluegill imitator, something like that. But these are going to be very effective. They'll work in ponds. You can catch some of your bigger fish. And the bites that you get on those bladed jigs are going to be big hits. Um, sometimes when you fish those soft plastic baits, it's more of a finesse presentation. So it's not so much that thump bite that you get always with crankbaits. That's why people love crankbaits. Power fishing is fun. When you can catch fish with search baits that you're power fishing, it's almost instant hookup because you got those trebles, you have tension with the line, you're in direct contact with the bait, fish hit them hard from behind them. You almost always get successful hookups. When you move into the soft plastics, the jigs, it's a lot of times bass can hit them because you're fishing them so slowly with such light weight. They'll grab them and it's really more watching your line. Is your line moving? Did it stop? Did it tick? As it was falling, you know you're not at the bottom yet, but all of a sudden it's not falling anymore. Um, that's when the quintessential bass hook set came into play that big hammer, these thick wire hooks into the back of these fish's mouth or through the lip plates. Um, and that's where braided line really came into the mainstream through bass fishing, which was fishing soft plastics, finesse style in heavy, heavy cover. So not only do you need the heavy line to pull out bigger fish, but because you're dealing with all of this vegetative junk, brush piles, you need to be able to get the fish through that. And the only way to do that is with braided line to ensure you're not going to snap. Um, 30 pound, 50 pound, 60 pound braided line is not going to snap on you. Um, if anything, if you do get snagged, you're going to have to cut your line. So when you are using braided line, Keep it to the big reservoirs. Uh, try to utilize it in areas that don't have a lot of known snags. And then if you're fishing the smaller bodies of water, your own pond, the neighborhood pond, you really want to try to cut down on that litter in the water. Because when you do get hung up with braid, you can hurt your reel. You can hurt your rod tip. Um, if you start forking that braided line, you're not going to pop your knot. You're going to end up hurting the drag on the reel because it's putting so much tension on it, or you're going to snap an eye guide, snap your rod deck in half or up towards the tip. 
tying on with a double uni knot or an FG knot. Double unis are a really easy knot to tie and they're a good connector knot for braided line to either fluorocarbon or monofilament line. Give yourself a two foot leader, one foot leader. Um, we're not that worried about uh, water clarity braided line affecting whether or not the fish can see it or not. But just giving yourself a foot of chew line, kind of like when you're fly fishing with tippets so you're not eating into your leader, tying on that just little piece, um, you're either going to, when you get hung up or snagged, you're able to either pop the knot right at the source on the eye hole of the hook, or more than likely what will happen is you're going to break the knot that you tied the connector knot onto, which is only going to leave, you know, a foot of a line in the water that will fall down. When you cut your line with that braided line, especially in smaller, heavily fish bodies of water, what ends up happening is you yourself and others start snagging the line that you left in the water. So now that snag is increased in uh, its overall ability to snag you up when you're fishing around that structure because that braided line is now, you know, free in the water. And a lot of times you'll snag that braided line. So something to think about when you're using braided line, if you're not in a position where you're catching fish and it's great because as long as you have the fish and you're not actually snagged with the lure into anything, you're going to be able to fork that fish out of whatever it's in, especially with a heavy action, medium, heavy action, casting rod, braided line, 30, 50, 65 pound test. That's where flipping jigs, flipping soft plastics, either Texas rig, um, weightless, maybe with a piece of split shot, any way that you're throwing these weedless soft plastics or um, soft plastics or jigs that have weed guards on them, you're able to get into that dense, thick cover that bass are going to get into during the spawn. And then again, as we get out of the post spawn and they're looking to do some ambushing in that near shore habitat as the vegetation starts to grow. Um, that's when your uh, braided line is really going to come into effect. So the other hybrid hard bait soft plastic trailer are just going to be your basic jigs and your skirted jigs. They're going to come in an assortment of styles. You're going to have, you know, these big football type heads on them. You could have shaky heads, round heads, swim heads. Um, and each one of those heads was originally designed to kind of do a different thing. You know, your football style heads or your shaky heads, you're really kind of fishing them along the bottom, allowing that, you know, trailer bait, which on a, a shaky head is going to be loose on the hook. So big trick worms, um, lizards, brush hogs, things that are going to attract a lot of attention, utilizing those and fishing them along the bottom, kind of hopping them or bouncing them. Uh, then the ones with swim heads on them, you can pair them with the bumper tail, paddle tail swim baits as a trailer and fish them middle of the water column, bottom third of the water column, upper water column, and just straight swim them in, cast and retrieve. Jigs are super versatile. Um, that's why they're really kind of always the number one bait in bass fishing is a jig. It just very versatile. You get a lot of you know, different action, different trailers, different situations, because it is kind of a multi uh, prey lure. You can, can be a frog, can be a crayfish, can be a bait fish, you know, it can do a lot of the same things as the same bait, depending on how you're fishing it. So you get a lot of multi-use, very versatile fishing lure for an artificial. So very common, again, blacks and blues, um, green pumpkin bases. Those are going to be the two kind of tried and true base colors to use. And then pairing your soft plastic uh, with it, that's a similar style in color. And then the length in which you're using, again, bigger bait profile, only bigger fish are going to get a hold of it. Small fish will peck at the appendages and you can get bit a lot, especially in ponds or small lakes where you tend to get a little bit more bass action than you would if you're fishing the shoreline of a big reservoir, where a good day out there fishing for a couple hours in the evening or the morning, you know, you're looking at hitting maybe eight to 12 fish. Like that would be a pretty good public access, getting the shoreline, going to a big body of water. You catch eight or 12 bass um, at any time of year on the big water. When you're fishing from the bank where you're limited to how far you can walk, you can't just trolling motor all the way around all those different coves and points you hit, you know, 10 fish in a day. That's a pretty good day of bass fishing especially if you hit a few good ones, you hit stuff that's over three, four pounds. It's a really good day. Now in ponds and small city lakes, that expectation of what you may catch, how many you may catch goes up exponentially. I mean, there's some days, depending on the pond, I mean, you, you're expecting to go out and catch 
30, 40, 50 bass in a day. A lot of them are going to be that six to 12 inch range, but in those ponds, you're also going to have that opportunity at catching those four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 pound bass, just depending on the pond, where you're at um, in the state, the genetics of the bass, Northern strains are going to kind of cap out around eight pounds naturally. And then when Florida genetics are introduced either through pure strains or through hybridization with Northern strains becoming F1s, um, the growth potential in a pond could, you know, get up all the way up to 10, 11 pounds. Um, so you have much better opportunities, bass fish and catching total numbers, biggest fish, small bodies of water. That's, that's where bass fishing, you know, takes place, but you're on those big reservoirs. It could be a 12 pounder. It could be a 14 pounder that you can access from the shoreline. And that's going to, that's only going to happen, you know, on those bigger bodies of water. So that's why we get out and we shore fish during this time of year, as those fish become easily accessible at public access in sheltered coves around points, um, creek mouths, creek arms, boat ramps, marinas, places that are easy to access by foot fish from the bank. And you have opportunity to tag a pretty exceptional fish that only happens on the big water with those real tremendous sizes. So with that, let's move right into the spawn. As these fish push up, they're ready to go. You've got, you're going to have, depending on the body of water, the amount of spawning habitat and the population of bass, this window is going to be somebody's water. It's going to be two weeks. Other bodies of water, it's going to be two months of fish coming and going, looking for places to spawn. Um, your bigger reservoirs are going to see more of a prolonged spawn. Um, whereas in ponds, depending on the population, they're going to be working that spawning cycle pretty quickly. Um, your sunfish, your crappie, if they've got crappie in there, and then your bass are all sharing basically the same habitat to spawn in, in small ponds. Um, so they're kind of in this battle to get done, get out of the way because sunfish are eating bass fry while bass are spawning then bass turn around and start eating sunfish and sunfish fry when sunfish spawn after them crappie spawn before both of them which is going to bring in bass and sunfish to predate on the crappie as well as the crappie eggs and fry so it's kind of constant chaos in ponds from if you're in the southern half of the state middle of march kind of kicks it off we're kind of right there now usually after daylight savings time the second we get that extra hour that's usually when your pond fishing starts, you start to see that first really good productive warm day, 70, 75 degrees, go out fishing in the middle of March. You're like, man, I'm catching a lot of fish. I'm getting bit real often. And then that only increases as you get into April, middle of April. And then once we start to get into the latter half of April, especially in the smaller bodies of water and ponds, water gets real hot um, pretty quickly. You'll start to see the bite die down and you have to pick your times a day, fish certain pockets of the water. But those small bodies of water, you typically, the entire pond for a four to six week window is just like, you can throw soft plastic after soft plastic after soft plastic, and you're just hitting all sorts of fish. Um, and you've got that opportunity to catch those real big bass um, as they push up. Um, see if there's any other questions before we move in. Um, Okay. So our soft plastics. So your primary soft plastic baits are going to be your worms, whether they be trick worms, curly tail worms, or just straight stick worms. Those are going to be primary bass equipment. Um, those along with the three inch curly tail grub were, which was the original swim bait um, before we started having the pre-molded swim baits and the the plastic molds creating these lifelike um, presentations that we get now with the ribbed and the bumper tails. Before all that, you basically had an eighth ounce, sixteenth ounce jig head, three inch curly tail grub, and a green pumpkin, black watermelon. That was it. You threw that up in parallel on the shoreline all day long, and that was your bass hammer. Then we had the big five, seven inch curly tail worm, black and chartreuse, all black. Uh, green pumpkin, watermelon. Again, fish the same way, throwing it on a jig head. Then we started throwing offset hooks on them and putting Texas rig, throwing a, a bullet weight on them or having a, now they have offset hooks that have the bullet weight 
built in to the eye of the hook head. So just connect it all the same, throw it out there, work your cover, flip and pitch all day long. Um, from there, we really started to just see the explosion of different soft plastics coming into the bass fishing world, the brush hogs, baby brush hogs, creature baits, crawfish, um, all different types of um, fish imitators, you know, for drop shotting and for different rigging purposes uh, really exploded. So your key kind of bass soft plastics that are always going to have success are going to be your stick worms fished wacky style, your tubes. Tubes are a very underutilized bass fishing um, soft plastic these days. They used to be all the craze back in the 80s and 90s, especially from the smallmouth guys throwing big three, four, five inch tubes because they're such a versatile soft plastic bait. Instead of having the skirt and the jig head and a trailer, it's kind of all built into one internally rigged with the jig head throw it down. You can fish them a lot of different ways. You can straight retrieve them. You can hop them and pop them. You can kind of bounce them through the middle of the water column, give them some darting action, very versatile baits. I love tubes for pond fishing, especially smaller size. Um, Bass Pros Crappie Max brand makes what they call a squirm and squirt. It comes in three different sizes. It comes in a two and a quarter inch magnum squirt, comes in an inch and a half and a two inch. I really like the inch and a half, the smallest one with a one thirty second ounce jig head. That is always my like first go to at any pond I go to. It's going to catch sunfish, it's going to catch crappie, and it's going to catch bass. Um, I use it on light action tackle or medium light action tackle, six pound test. Makes it difficult when you hook a five pound fish. Um, five pound fish has all the control in the world, but you will ding, you know, six inch fish up to three pound fish. And have a lot of fun working just a um, green pumpkin, red and black flake tube in Oklahoma. Little inch and a half squirm and squirt heads come that you can buy at Bass Pro that are meant for those. Uh, they have a longer lead down the shaft. So when fish bite at it, instead of having a ball head or something that's up towards the top where they can really clamp down on that soft plastic and tear it up. Um, the squirm and squirt heads get you a little bit more life expectancy out of those um, soft plastics because with the jig or with the tubes, you're internally rigged. So when you're tying on, when the fish has destroyed the tentacles or ripped the body of the bait in half, you're having to cut off and retie on, which when fishing is great, you know, you don't mind doing it. But when fishing is a little slow or something like that, that one fish comes and tears it apart. You know, you're having to retie. So the more life expectancy you can get out of your soft plastic, the better. But that's my go to. I mean, if I'm going to ponds or small lakes, I'm tube all day long. And then from there, uh, weightless, weedless, wacky rigged stick worm in a green pumpkin, red and black flake, red and black, orange and black, uh, either a three inch or a five inch. Um, the finesse TRDs that are a Z man bait, those are great drop shotted fishing them, little kind of two and a quarter inch, two and a half inch bait profile. But that's as far as I get when it comes to soft plastics fishing small bodies of water in ponds. When you're on the bigger water um, and you're trying to cover a little bit more water, then all of a sudden, like lizards, Texas rigged, grubs, curly tail worms. Um, trick worms, things that are going to get a lot of action in the water that you're more likely to swim as opposed to real still fishing and picking apart. Because as these fish push up to spawn, they're going to be in water anywhere from a foot to four feet deep, backs of coves, marinas, you know, up against these shallow, gently sloping shelves that's protected water. So you can cast these things parallel five, 10 feet off the bank and work them parallel down the bank Lizards work great. Brush hogs work great. Curly tail grubs, curly tail worms, um, black, black and chartreuse, green pumpkin, watermelon, and then purple, which is typically labeled as June bug. Those are your primary colors. If you're using one of those Texas style on a jig head, um, and in some cases, if they're really shallow um, and you want to slow down your retrieve, throwing them on just an offset three aught up to like five aught hook, um, just like an extra wide gap or just a wide gap offset worm hook. Um, 
and throwing on any of those soft plastics that way, you're going to find the most amount of success throwing a soft plastic, especially as those fish get onto their beds. When they're getting on their beds, those fish are no longer actively feeding. So they are in defend mode. So the things that you can run near or across those bedding areas um, that they think are coming in to eat the eggs or predate on the fry. So things with lots of appendages, baby brush hogs, lizards, things that come running in, you know, medium to a little bit bigger size bait profiles that will really threaten those female and male bass when they're in and around their beds. You're going to get those reactionary strikes uh, when you're doing that. Then also, again, in like smaller bodies of water, fishing things like um, jointed swim baits, magic shad, um, white chartreuse. Uh, I see somebody put it in the chat bar, flukes. Flukes and uh, magic shad are jointed swim baits. Um, fishing those weightless and weedless too. Big bait profiles. Um, you're going to find actively feeding fish with any of those. But that's what you're looking for when we really get into the heart of the spawn. When those fish are up on the bank, up shallow, defending um, big soft plastic baits. And we'll just go through a few of the different like rigging styles that you can do. Make sure that when you are buying these soft plastics that you're rigging them correctly so they're working most effectively, mainly so you get a good hook set. Um, if you're putting the bait on wrong and a fish hits at it, you, you know, you're not maybe getting the fish up over the hook point. So let's see a few different styles of like hook heads. So if you really wanted to drag something through beds, something like a shaky head jig. So we've got the offset hook. This is going to be about a three aught offset hook. Um, and then that jig head on it is free on a little clip right there so it moves free of the hook so as this be is being drug along the bottom you have that soft plastic on it with which um with water the water volume is going to float that bait so your bait is going to be in a vertical presentation so the tail of a fluke the curly tail of a of a big worm or appendages of the lizard or of a brush hog this is going to be great for running it down through um, those uh, bedding areas. Those fish are going to attack that if it's going to get drugged right through their bed. You can accomplish the same thing with just a basic jig head, Texas rigged, or some you know hybrid style Texas rig where the actual uh, weight is on the top. And I've, I have some of those in one of these boxes. But with any of these offset hooks, so if we were to take like a big trick worm like this, this is a real good color pattern. Depending on the brand, sometimes watermelon are closer to green pumpkin, in my opinion, and in other brands, green pumpkin's more closer to watermelon. But we're looking for something with just that real dark green, red flake through it, black flake through it. This is a big bait profile. This is going to be like an eight inch bait profile with the meat of it being in that first three or four inches and then tapering down into a real small tail, which allows for this to have all the action. So when you're rigging these with offset hooks, we want to go through the belly of the bait. So in this case, the belly is going to be um, on that flat side of the, we don't always have that. Different baits will be different, but identifying what's the top of the bait and what's the bottom of the bait. Typically, if you have dual colored soft plastics, the darker color is the back, the lighter color is the bottom with any type of fish or prey source that's in the water, dark backs, light underbellies. Dark backs, because avian predators, um, they're going to blend in with the bottom. So they match from the top. Light bellies, for predators from below, when they're looking up at the sky, it's a light sky, that light belly blends in. So when you're looking at baits, the lighter side is the bottom, darker side is the top. So in this case, our flat side is the bottom of our bait. So... What we want to do to make this thing weedless and get this on there is we want to go in through the nose of the bait and then you come down about a quarter of an inch and pop that out dead center in the bottom of the bait and pop it through and then work the hook up the shank or work the lure up the hook shank and then it'll turn when it gets up over that collar. That way the back of our bait is on the hook point side and then from there we're just going to press that through dead center in the middle of the belly right at the bend 
So you don't want to take up way up here. We want this to sit nice and flush. So basically right where that hook point will hit the bottom, you just create a little bit of bend right there to give a little extra space to pull through, pull it right through the top of the bait. And then to make it weedless, we just pull that soft plastic forward on the hook point and let it fall back and it embeds it in it. And something like this, you can drag this through the bottom and you're going to get all of this tail action up on the top. This is a very big bait. If you put this near a big female who's just recently either gotten on that bed, is dropping eggs, big bait profile, you know, you're going to get hit on something like that. But that's what you're looking to do if you're using one of these free shaky head jigs that's meant to be drug across the bottom, allowing for the soft plastic to get all that action, making it look like it's a predator that's vacuuming the floor of the, you know, the bottom of the water body, which is going to be the eggs sitting in the nest. So you're going to get that lizard coming through that's trying to eat those eggs or that bait fish that's sucking up off the bottom. That's where that shaky head jig is really, really effective. But you can accomplish the same thing in a lot of different ways. But with all these offset hooks, regardless of what the head of the hook is, that's how you're going to rig them. Through the bottom, through the nose of the bait first, hook point out through the bottom of the bait, about a quarter inch, and then you just work it up the shank. And when you get to the top, it's going to rotate to get around that collar, which is going to then bring the top of the bait to the hook point side. And that's exactly where we want it. And then from there, you can just embed it into that soft plastic, make it uh, weedless so that if it does hit a branch or a twig, the hook point isn't burying it in. And you can work that soft plastic through the nastiest junk that you're trying to get through. But you're looking for like an eighth ounce in, in small water ponds and uh, city lakes, if you're out in bigger, deeper water, um, more current, more wind, more things that are going to affect that bait, maintaining contact with the bottom. In addition to how fast your retrieval speed is, you're going to look for like a quarter ounce is probably going to be plenty or a three eighths for the jig head. Um, here's my bass tube box for, for the big water. So five, four, three, and two and a half inch. Um, Tubes, all pretty much the same color in here. Green pumpkin, red and black flake. Little lighter colored one, basically a faded for that real turbid water, um, but still keeping that red flake in it. Then with these, you can get a lot of different hook heads for them. You can bury just a very basic lead ball hook. Internally rig them. They're going to have the hollow underbelly and you just work the jig head up into that bait all the way up to the top. And then you can pop um, this hook shank is too small for this lure. Um, let's see if we got one rigged up. Here's one that's rigged up. So when you get them up, that eye hole will just pull. You can press it. It's kind of hard to see, but right there, it'll just press right through that soft plastic. Jigs are great or uh, tubes are great on a little jig head. Again, you can just let this fall down to the bottom. That jig head's gonna sit on the bottom. You're gonna be reeling slowly. And this thing is a really good bait profile for a lot of different sizes of bass. And you can kick that right along the bottom, trying to find in and around those bedding areas, or just as they're getting to the late pre-spawn, up shallow, looking to gorge, tube is just gonna be a great multi-purpose bait. So when you're on that bigger water with a lot more bigger fish, um, utilizing like the three inch tube, four inch tube is going to be great when you're on ponds, smaller, uh, lakes, looking at like the Magnum squirt, which is that two and a quarter inch and using like an eighth ounce jig head or a 16th ounce jig head will be perfect. Um, if you're looking to get some bigger fish, can't really go wrong with the tube. Um, uh, let's see what else we got here. Brush hogs, which again, all these soft plastics can be used in conjunction with uh, spinner bait jigs or skirts, um, jigs with skirts, bladed jigs with skirts. These can all be used as trailers, um, but they can also be fished by themselves with either a jig head 
or an offset hook with some type of weight Carolina rig, which is going to require a leader line, which again, you're just dragging across the bottom. It's just different ways, different styles from different anglers from different regions over the years found their way of getting to these fish. And we're all looking to do the same thing, um, which is disrupt these fish during their spawning cycle, taking advantage of the fact that they're ultra aggressive and they're willing to either gorge themselves for food or defend their nest, their fry, their eggs um, to extreme. So they're going to go after just about anything that goes across. So here is one of those uh, jig hook combinations or bullet weights, that Texas rig where it's built into the actual hook itself. So it gives you a little bit longer shank up above the collar to work that soft plastic in. This is a very small 1 16th ounce. Um, so using that with like a small stick worm where you can put that on and make it weedless, or weedless. we'd rig that just like we rigged the rest of them. Um, But brush hogs, so here's a box of similarly colored stick worms, little trick worm, and then some baby brush hogs. Again, green pumpkin bases. So we get more of that kind of bluegill color with this, with that purple and green flake mixed in, that iridescent. Um, we got that there and here, and then we have more of the green pumpkin with the red base. Um, this one... It's kind of a combo of all of them that's got the red, the purple, the green, got all those great colors mixed in with that base. And with these, uh, let's find a good offset hook somewhere. So with any of these baits, you can take your bullet weight, if you have one, um, or you can just fish them weightless and weedless. If you're out on the big water, reservoirs, rivers, probably going to want to go with the bullet weight to drag them along the bottom. You can also Carolina rig them. Um, where is that? Pre-made Carolina rig. So Carolina rig, you're going to have this connected to your main line. That's where you'd tie on your main line. This is where you would tie your leader line onto the back foot leader line, maybe, and then connected to a hook, probably an offset hook, something like this. That's got your brush hog on it, or it's got your lizard on it. Or it's got your worm on it. Different way to drag it across the bottom or you can use the bullet weight on the main line, put that on first, then tie it on your hook. Brush hogs are unisex on either side. So with these, we want to be coming out on the flat side on either side. We don't want to come out on the appendage side. So we want those on both sides, that behind. So we take the nose of the bait, go right into the hook point, right to the nose, down about a quarter inch, out through one of the flat sides, pull that up the hook shank. It'll turn on the collar, suck up above the eye hole once you are tied on. So if you wanted to fish it weightless, it completely covers your hook up. And then take it at the bend, go through, up through the other flat side on the top, pull that bait forward a little bit, make it weight weightless and weedless and fish it just like that. So in ponds, creeks, small still water, weightless is good because that allows you to fish real slow. So, you know, even when we're getting into the spawn, the water temps are still fairly low. Fish are willing to give chase, but um, anytime you can fish slow presentations in smaller water, um, especially ponds, city lakes that can get a lot of pressure, <clears throat> they'll get shell shocked with, hard baits, rattled baits, bladed baits, things that are making a lot of disruption. Ponds are naturally quiet places from the occasional bullfrog hop in the water, occasional bass blow up, ducks landing. They're very calm, usually wind protected areas. You're building a pond 
they're new, not very big. A lot of times they got trees surrounding them. They're very protected year round. So weightless, quiet, subtle, natural color presentations are going to get you bit more often in small bodies of water most of the year than throwing big weight on really fast ripping baits through the water baits that are going to make a ton of noise tons of disruption just nice and subtle drop these down fish them parallel with the bank you can slow roll them you can cast them maybe just let them sink down to the bottom and then just jig your rod tip up three to twelve o'clock let this come up and then flutter back down if you want to attack beds on the reservoirs or even on your ponds throwing that bullet weight up on the main line and then dragging it along the bottom. Those appendages will come up and doing that behind the Carolina with the leader line. This is going to drag it down on the bottom because this is weightless. It's going to sit a little bit up off the bottom, which is going to keep it out of any type of debris fields, leaves, twigs, things that it might get hung up on. So it'll just keep it a little bit higher up within a foot of the bottom being drug right behind that you drag that near um, around bedding areas and um, you're going to get bit. But that's how you'd rig your lizard. That's how you rig your brush hog. That's how you're going to rig your crawfish, anything where um, you have these appendages, you want to keep them on the side. Now, if you're doing like a curly tail grub, you want the hook point to be on the curly tail point. So, if we were to take a grub, find this box that's got some grubs in it. I think these are all twin tails. Mm, nope, we got some single point. Perfect. So three inch curly tail grub. You can put this on a jig head or you put it on the offset hook with a bullet weight or again, fish it weightless and weedless and just real slow, allow it to sink, let it fall all the way down to the bottom. And then once your line goes slack, you can tell it's hit something. It's then just really slowly retrieve it in those smaller bodies of water on the reservoirs, probably best off going with just a jig head. Um, like an eight ounce jig head is probably going to be perfect. In most cases, when you're fishing parallel with the bank, um, something like this, just a jig head to throw on there. But either way, whether you're using a jig head or a offset hook, either way, we want that hook point coming out the back of the bait. Most of the time, the seam line is also where the tail comes out on the back and on the top. And we want that tail side of the grub or curly tail worm coming upward. So again, if you want to know right where to pull it out of the back, you can line that up with the jig head, see where it comes out and then pinch it and hold it there and then utilize it. Or as you do it more often, just, you know, kind of where on the different, the baits that you use most often, you'll start to notice like what part of the bait or maybe the rib, if there's only a few ribs that are on there, um, where to bring it out but there's usually a seam line that you can see and if you can pop that hook point out right on the seam line you know you're going to be lined up nice and flush so put that on there and we're up on the top like that and these are just straight grubs are simple it doesn't get it. it's like a crankbait but soft plastic these are just a straight retrieve Nothing fancy, no jigging, cast a grub, reel a grub, looks just like a little sunfish swimming through the water. This is a fat Albert grub in um, root beer with green pepper flake is what it's labeled as. This is great in streams across the state, eastern half of the state, southern part of the state. These are going to catch smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, spotted bass, um, but they're a, a real good color scheme to use. And then Bass Pro sells their generic version of it in a twin tail as well as a single tail in a few different sizes and that color is pretty close this the fat albert's just a little bit lighter because it has less flaking in it and then the bass pro tends to have a little bit more flaking in it but 
that's that dynamite color for stream fishing, but it's also going to be really productive on your main bodies of water just because it does such a good job of imitating a few different um, sunfish species that those bass really key in on. Um, we're coming up on an hour. Like I said, there, I mean, it's bass fishing. We could spend two hours on each soft plastic. Um, see the questions, any recommendations for shallower lakes and reservoirs? So if I'm in that, if I'm fishing a shallow, smaller body of water, I'm going to look to get out middle of April. Um, depending on what part of the state it's in. If I'm in the southeastern part of the state, I'm going to get out there in the next couple of weeks, start looking to see if I can get on some bigger fish. Central part of the state, northern part of the state, you're really looking at around the 1st of April to really start to see those bigger fish getting up very shallow looking to spawn. Um, we really are looking for water temperatures to get around 60 degrees before we start seeing um, them get into that real good pre-spawn gorge they're going to look to spawn depending on the fish depending on the body of water somewhere between like 60 and 65 degrees that's what they're looking for for their spawning some will do it on the higher end up towards 70 degrees some of them will do it on the lower end low 60s but that's really what you're looking for you typically once you get within a few degrees of their optimal spawning temperature for each fish that is really what's going to drive them um to bite consistently. That's when the best fishing is going to occur on any body of water in that shallow water. Um, but I would be focusing on, you know, your soft plastics up and around um, those key spawning areas, tubes, lizards, brush hogs, fished really slowly, either with weight or weightless, um, or like a bladed jig with the trailer on it, with one of the same, either a brush, brush hog, lizard, crawfish, stick worm, um, curly tail worm, bumper tail, it, really any swim bait that, or a soft plastic trailer that's going to work with that swim jig or that bladed jig. Um, that's what I would be looking to use. I'd, your crankbaits, your jerk baits, those smaller bodies of water, um, you probably catch a few fish, but you're going to find a lot more consistent bite with smaller soft plastic baits, grubs, tubes, stick worms, fish, weightless, weedless, wacky style. Um, that's where you're really going to find success on the smaller bodies of water. Um, is it better for darker jig head or lighter jig head? Um, it, Again, I like to try to pair whatever trailer I'm using, whether it's with a skirted uh, presentation, spinner bait, jig. Um, I try to match, you know, whatever the main body of the hook with the head or the skirt is with the trailer. So if it's a green pumpkin base, if it's a black jig head, you know, a black jig head is going to go with just about anything. Um, but if I was using like, you know, a white bait for example you know you might go with the white jig head or a black jig head but i probably wouldn't use like a pink jig head with the white um but it doesn't mean you're not going to get those reactionary strikes but for bass fishing in oklahoma to pick up the most amount of fish the most bites fishing from the bank if you can take away anything from this presentation um which these are designed for the masses you know each individual body of water is going to have particular success stories um, for people who fish them all of the time. You know, you just get really keyed in. But there's always fish to be caught by anybody of any angling ability um, at any body of water during these peak windows. And for largemouth bass, that is going to be April. You're going to catch some bigger fish in March. That's just you got more opportunities at catching bigger fish in deeper water as they're pushing up shallow transition. But those same fish are eventually going to make it to that shallow water to complete their spawning cycle. And that is going to occur in April. Um, in some parts of the state up north, if it's been a cold, particularly cold spring, uh, cold rains of inflowing water, if we get big flooding events where the water you know, the air temperatures are 45, 50 degrees, you pick up six inches of rain. That's a lot of cold water that will lower those water temperatures. So 
it's usually all of April, but middle of April, second week of April, third week of April is typically the peak window in most parts of the state on all sizes of water bodies. If you're on the big reservoirs, if you're going to an area, you know, fairly decent sized reservoir, you're going to a public access area, maybe you've got a couple of coves and a big point or a few points, maybe the dam where you can, in a few hours, cover, you know, a few hundred yards of shoreline. If you can do that, if you can find a place like that, fishing the middle of April, having maybe two rods with you, um, if you really you want to get a lot of fishing in, a lot of different types of fishing, two rods, one rigged for soft plastics, one rigged for hard baits um, or search baits. You know, we didn't really even get into the swim baits, uh, pre-molded swim baits, like in ponds um, or bigger water with the bigger ones. But like if you're in a pond, these little storm wild eye shad, um, this is, these things are dynamite, little bluegill or just a little basic shad minnow those are lights out i mean small bait profile two inches you can fish those all day long and they're super easy to fish cast them out medium retrieve depending on the depth you know they could be middle water column or down on the bottom you're going to get bit on these all day long if you want something to just cast and retrieve you can use them in the reservoirs the smaller ones are going to find more crappie more white bass, the bigger sized ones, the three, four inch bait profiles will find less of the pan fish or the white bass will start to target large mouth, but a search bait, shallow diving crankbait, square bill in a shad pattern or that kind of purple, gray, yellow, something like that. Having something rigged up, whatever you're comfortable with, whether that be that lipless crankbait in a red or a um, silver, Build crankbait, one to five feet diver in a basic shad, chartreuse, or some type of purple gold, you know, mimicking a sunfish or a pre-molded swim bait. Having a rod rigged up with one of those three things, fished in mid-April, parallel with the banks. So when you can make casts and you can kind of flip them up, keep them in the strike zone longer at that right depth as opposed to casting straight out into a cove and coming straight back at you, that means you have to be hitting structure where fish are holding. But when you're working parallel with the shoreline and coming down, you're more likely to stay on that transition structure longer, which is the strike zone where those fish are looking to push. So parallel casting with the bank, one rod rigged up with a hard bait or a pre-molded swim bait, something in either a shad, chartreuse, bluegill pattern. And then a rig or a rod rigged up for a soft plastic, whether that be a tube, whether that be a, um, a wacky rigged like stick worm, something uh, where are worms at. So this is a really good color. This is a Yamamoto Senko. These are expensive when compared to other soft plastics, they also rip very easily. So you, these can be a one hitter quitter. You catch one fish and it tears it in half, but because of that, they are very, you know, nice, soft, get real good action in the water. Utilizing a wacky rig hook, got a weed guard on it. You can use just a little octopus hook. You can even do it on the big five aught, you know, offset hooks. A lot of people do that, but they do make specific wacky rigged hooks that will have little weed guards on them to help you stay out of stuff. They're going to look something like that. Um, you can also use, um, they make little rubber bands that go around. And so you basically, it comes in what looks like a pencil tube and you stick the soft plastic in that pencil tube. And then it's got a bunch of these O-rings on them and you roll one of the O-rings down on and then around the hook. So the worm is basically sitting below the hook shank and tied to it with the uh, O-ring. And that's supposed to get you longer usage because instead of the hook point being straight through the middle of the bait, where when it does get hit, it's tearing against that hook shank. It essentially allows for the O-ring where when you're 
they bite the bait, but then your hook is pulling into the fish. So when you're fighting the fish, this is not connected to the hook. So you can utilize those um, and put those on, or, or you can just go right through the lighter color of the bait, darker color on the back, pull it straight through the middle of the body, which on these five inch dingers is typically right behind this little plate right here for the ribbing. They're going to have that middle. And that's usually for when you're using an offset hook, that that's about the right distance to pull out the hook point. But when you're wacky rig, you're usually just a shade behind that to make sure that it's equally. And then it just pulses down in the water. That's a surefire hitter when bass are up shallow. You just toss that out weightless, maybe a piece of split shot on it if there's a lot of wind or current, and just let it fall down to the bottom, pop it up, let it fall again. You're going to see your line get tight, or you're going to see it go from getting tight to really loose because a fish hit it, swam towards you, puts a big bow in the line. Um, that's a surefire way to catch a lot of fish. I like that color a lot, but you can also get a lot of bites with the basic um, green pumpkin base you're gonna get bit a lot with those green pumpkin bases um or june bug let's see so here's green pumpkin with the with black flake and then kind of a green pumpkin or watermelon with that red and black flake those are two dynamite colors and then they make them in just an assortment you know that purple the june bug color also a good one um you can also fish them with the offset hook. Uh, where those offset hooks go? And you can rig them weightless and weedless and kind of give them more of a, a swimming action instead of just the wacky rig fall. So it's more of a darting and rising and falling and you get a lot of good action depending on the brand. So if they're like... Um, yum dingers so this is a yum dinger it's going to have that hook slot on the top side i don't know if that's going to show up on the webcam but right there there's a hook slot that comes down that's a little just indent into the bait so when we rig it we want to make sure that that hook slot is on that's going to be at the top side of our bait so when we go in through the nose with the hook point come down about a quarter inch out basically you take the bait and push it up to where the hook point turns. And from there, pop it out because usually the hook point is fairly similar in size to the collar, depending on the brand. But that's usually a good rule of thumb because it's OK when you work it up. If it comes up over the hook point or the hook eye of the hook, if you have some excess plastic to pull up over the top, it's just going to hide the hook. Um, eye and then we come out through the bottom of the bait through that little gap and what that is is basically essentially they made that so that you don't have to pull the soft plastic to embed it to make it weedless it's just kind of the hook stays covered in that but that doesn't mean that that doesn't get knocked up against a tree branch and expose that hook point so even in these i still embed that hook point just a little bit but you fish it like this this is going to give it a faster sinking action when it's fished like this so it's going to fall fall rate's going to be faster and you can straight swim it and you're going to get all that kicking action of that or you can cast it to a location let it fall pick it up let it fall again pick the rod tip up pick up your, as it falls, pick your slack back up and then do it again. And you essentially just hop and pop it all the way back to you. And those are the two ways on these stick worms. It's really hard to beat those, um, especially on the small bodies of water, ponds, small reservoirs, shallow reservoirs, um, Wichita mountains, any of those lakes. Stick worms are pretty difficult to beat for consistency along with tubes but you're also going to get pretty consistent bite action with lizards especially the later end of the year we get um later april early may different size lizards here's a box of some different size lizards pretty basic color schemes 
greens, green pumpkins, olive, and a little bit of that purple June bug, different sizes, three inch up to like seven inch lizards. You can fish them on a jig head. All of these soft plastics when not being used as trailers can either be rigged uh, weedless where you're basically putting it through the nose of the bait, coming out a quarter inch on the bottom of the bait, working it up, putting it over the collar, and then going through the bottom of the bait out the back. And then your hook point is lined up with the collar and the eye hole. So you're just fishing it like that. You have this underhang. You can fish it with the bullet weight. You can fish it off of a Carolina trailer um, or you have a shaky head jig that's got the offset hook. But that's going to be the one way to rig it or you're going to put it on a jig head. Either way, you're rigging it in basically the same style. Most of these soft plastics are not meant to work the entire soft plastic up the shank of the hook. Um, only times you're really looking to do that is with like a grub or maybe like a, a curly tail worm when you're putting it on to a jig head um, or like a brush hog, you're putting it onto a, um, throwing it onto a jig head where you go. Like if you didn't want to use the offset hook, if you wanted the weight, but didn't want to use a bullet weight. So you had a jig head and you don't have that offset up on the collar to, you can still do it you know, with a hook like this, where we have the hook point that's back towards the eye hole. So in theory, you could put this on there and pop it out just like you would on those offset hooks and work it up to the collar, push it over that collar, and then pull it up to give it a little bit of weedless action. And you could rig it on there, something like that. And that you can make it weightless or a weedless on the jig head but typically when you're using the jig head it usually means you're swimming it um and so with those you're really just working the bait all the way on the hook shank bringing it down about mid body upper third of the body depending on the size and then just working that bait up over the collar so it sits flush like that but then your hook point is exposed but that's it. I mean, all the soft plastics are going to rig in like one of three ways on a hook. It's either going to be bodied to the midpoint or the upper third, depending on the length of the bait on a jig head, or it's going to be popped out and fished up like this on an offset hook, or you're going to be fishing it on a small, um, you know, octopus hook or something that's labeled as a, uh, uh, wacky rig hook. And then in that case, with those stick worms, you're just putting it on middle of the body and putting it on. So one of three ways, and that's really all you need. There are dozens of different ways to rig up. Um, drop shots, um, tying on a drop shot hook, you know, in a small body of water where you can keep that bait parallel um, with the bottom and work it through. And in those cases, you're just using a small, like sometimes they're labeled drop shot hooks. I prefer things that are labeled wide gap octopus hooks and using those for a drop shot hook. I just like those hooks better. Um, a lot of times the ones that are labeled as drop shot, the way that the uh, hook point and the eye line up, I don't get good hook sets. I kind of want more of a wide gap offset hook. Uh, I'll just, where the hook point and the uh, eye hole are both going the same direction as opposed to pointing at each other. Because what happens is that fish sucks that bait in because you have that weight hanging below it. If that hook point is faced out towards the eye guide, a lot of times you can pull the, the whole bait and hook free. Whereas on those octopus hooks, the hook point is faced in the same direction as the eye hole, but they're offset. So they look like that. So when you go to set the hook, here's the eye hole, here's the hook point. It's basically pulling it right into the roof of the mouth when you're fishing, because you're fishing uphill, either if you're fishing from a boat or from the bank. Um, but drop shotting is, you know, unnecessary when fishing gets good. You know, you're going to drop shot in the dead of the summer, dead of the winter, when you really just need a still presentation. Um, to leave it in front of a fish longer and get them to bite. 
you know, they're not willing to give chase when their metabolic rates are low. And then in the summertime, when the low oxygen level, they're super stressed out, then they're trying to conserve energy um, for the same reason, just with two different, the extremes of the environmental factors. But that's pretty much it. I mean, for bass fishing, um, you know, true trophy anglers, are going to be boat fishing, you know, in order to really get after those giants and have the most chances at them, you got to be fishing from a boat late winter in through March as we hit that early spring window. But those fish have to come shallow. They have to come to the bank anglers. That is going to occur in April. Um, maybe late March if you're down in the Southern part of the um, state, but by and large, the bank angler window for catching the most amount of bass from the shore and the biggest bass from the shore is going to be the middle of April. That is going to be the peak window. Some Southern part of the state is going to kick off the beginning of April and run through April. Central part of the state is going to be more like the second, third week of April running through the first week of May as we push up into the Northern half of the state, especially the Northwest. It's going to kick off kind of towards the middle, the end of April and run to the, beginning middle part of may and the window on each body of water is just going to be dependent on available spawning habitat and overall population of the bass that have to come in as well as what are the other species and their spawning because sunfishes crappie rock bass sunfish and black bass utilize similar habitat in basically the same areas to spawn so they each have to come through and complete their cycle if there's more space available, more ideal habitat, they can go knock that thing out in a week or two. If they're having to basically rotate in and out to have female fish drop eggs and male fish come in to fertilize the eggs and defend the fry, smaller bodies of water that might last for a long window. It might be a six, eight week window because these bass are just, you know, there's too many of them and not enough space. So it's really just dependent on that. But as a bank angler, that's what you're looking for. Water temperatures above 60 degrees, prolonged periods of overnight lows that are in the 50s, preferably even getting close to 60 degrees. Southerly winds, southwestern winds, daytime highs above 70 degrees, overnight lows above 50. You get that for about two, three weeks straight where that's the primary weather pattern. That bass action in shallow water is going to be a light switch. And then depending on where the crappie are at in their spawning cycle, those bass are going to get in after those crappie are done and they're going to utilize similar habitat to start spawning. And so if you have that in the back of your head, um, if you're on the bigger water, uh, big reservoirs, days with a little bit of wind, um, not gale force. But if you got just a little bit of water breakup, it's not just glass water. You're going to have better bite action with moving baits, swim baits crankbaits, jerkbaits, those search power baits, um, bladed jigs, uh, square bills, lipless crankbaits, spinner baits. Those are going to be most effective when you got a little bit of chop on the water, breaks up the surface. Um, when it's dead calm, going with the soft plastics, picking apart, you know, areas and that's going to be earlier in the spawn. But once you get to where those fish are up spawning mode, up on the banks, very, very shallow, then moving away from the big power baits, maybe other than like a pre-molded swim bait, and then looking to utilize things like a tube or a brush hog or a lizard or a wacky rigged worm, working parallel with the bank, picking apart areas, and then just making those casts. Fan casting out and in. So if you're casting parallel down the bank, make that first cast out to the deeper water. Work it back in at an angle. Then cast a few feet towards the bank, back in. Then from that cast, a few feet in until you find fish. And just fan cast and work shoreline. Start out on the points, secondary points, work your way shallow. Find where fish are at. Um, they're going to tell you what type of habitat that they're in. If you're just finding fish in the back of creek arms and coves, then if you have a lot of public access where you can hit multiple coves in the same access area, start at the backs of the coves. You know, they're going to tell you where they want them. Um, but it, but when you get there and you got to figure it out, you know, starting on the deeper ends 
and then working back shallow, making fan casts out from the deeper water, eventually all the way shallow, picking apart an area with your casting distance. So however far you can cast that bait, work it in a complete fan motion. You're moving a couple of feet each time and then move down, then move down, then move down and just keep working that shoreline and pick it apart. <clears throat> and if you have the soft plastic on one rig and your power search bait, whether it be a hard bait or a pre-molded swim bait or a big swim bait with a jig head, you know, just whatever you're most comfortable throwing, um, that's going to be, that's what you're looking for in bass fishing. And then you want to take it a step farther. If you fish neighborhood ponds, if you spent, fish small city lakes that it, that's your local water you have your own pond and you want to improve the quality of that bass fishery start harvesting fish start picking off fish 8 to 14 inches they fillet well they eat great they cook well bass tastes good um you know you're gonna have a hard time telling the difference between a bass fillet and a crappie fillet or a catfish fillet if you clean them properly um it's just a good white fish not red meat on it, very easy to clean, and you get those perfect fillet strips off of 8 to 14 inch fish, and it's really going to start to help improve um, not only the genetics, but the overall trophy potential of smaller bodies of water, ponds, city lakes, small reservoirs. Um, you know, get family and friends out there when it gets good. Take somebody new fishing. Throw in these basic type baits, especially for new anglers. You take out a family member or a friend who really doesn't have a lot of casting experience or fishing experience, sticking with like an eighth ounce or a quarter ounce pre-molded swim bait, something that they can cast out and just reel in. Doesn't get any simpler than like a storm wild eye shad in a bluegill or a shad or a chartreuse shad, very basic colors, have them cast that parallel with the shoreline, more than likely they're going to catch fish. On those smaller bodies of water, take three or four people, you know, you can get 24 or 30 fish out of the trip. That's plenty for a fish fry. You know, it's not like cleaning crappie. Even a 10 inch bass is going to have a lot more meat on it than a 10 inch crappie is. So um, taking advantage of that, it's, you know, it's really that fun time of year that we're getting into. White bass are right there rearing to go right now. Crappie will follow shortly behind them towards the end of this month into early April. And then once that crappie fishing, when you see our fishing reports, you see Facebook or your social media, or you hear on the news or word of mouth at the bait and tackle store, hey, we're killing crappie. When you hear people are killing crappie shallow, that means that the bass bite is about two weeks away. Um, and that's just kind of how it works itself out. White bass and walleye go first followed by your crappie, followed by your bass, followed by your sunfish, followed by your catfish. Then we're in dog days of summer. Fishing completely changes on how you approach where you're fishing, how you're fishing, when you're fishing. Um, and then we move into fall and winter, and then we're back here again. So real fun time of year. We appreciate everybody being here. Um, we are a non-appropriated state agency, which means we get zero state tax dollars. We are completely funded by fishing and hunting license sales. Every dollar that is spent on that, those people go out and participate. Every time you buy um, tackle, fishing rods, boat fuel, ammo, guns, um, all of that excise tax that comes off of that um, from wherever you buy it from goes into a big federal pot. And the federal, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service redistributes th those funds back to state agencies based off of their total number of license holders per population and this land size. How big is their state? Oklahoma is one of the best states in the country for both. We are a large um, physical state, but we also have one in three people who are a hunter or an angler who hold the license, which means that the more people who buy fishing licenses, we get to use a quarter of that money to get match 75% from that federal fund. So if there is a $400,000 project, all the department has to do is contribute $100,000 from revenue from fishing and license sales to get $300,000 from the federal government through grant. And that's pretty much what funds all of our fish and wildlife work. So when there's new boat ramps that are built, when food plots are going out, when roads are being made, any of that, that is all from you guys, from buying 
hunting and fishing equipment, being licensed anglers, and then the state taking those funds and getting 75% match from the gear and the equipment that you buy. And that goes right back into the state. Um, and then the rest of our money that we get from license just goes to general ops, fuel, salaries, keeping the lights on. But all of the rest of it, that is our major funding. So we cannot do this without you. You play an integral role in not only the success of these sports, the future of these sports, the protection of these resources, hopefully some enhancement to the things that um, we found over time that we have done damage to um, stocking of species that have done harm or, uh, you know, agricultural practices, management practices, things we're constantly learning our environment, how we can better that and ensure that this continues with the North American model of hunting and fishing. We do not want it to turn in to the rest of the world, which is more of a feudal system. The very richest people own everything and they're the only ones who get to go hunting and fishing. Um, we still have it in North America where hunting and fishing is for all. It is our goal and plan to keep it that way. And that only happens with you guys showing interest. And in return, we want to share everything that we know about these sports um, to help you find the most success. Hopefully become confident. These are confidence building sports. They're fun. It's nice to be outside, but it's also great when you can be successful participating. And in doing so, you are then helping to you know spread this tradition and heritage through your kids, through your family members, through your neighbors, through classmates, through anything, just being involved um, really goes a long ways in ways that the majority of people don't even understand how important it is to the actual resource itself that all of you guys play by attending these Ask and Anglers, by buying fishing licenses, by going out there, getting after it and enjoying it. So we thank you for that. We have a lot more of these webinars coming up in the next couple of months. We have another two next week on um, walleye sawgye from the bank and tailwaters, I believe, is next week. Um, we'll have a catfish and a sunfish. We'll have a fly fishing for warm water species, targeting non-game fish uh, from the bank, and then wet wading the Illinois River system, which is an awesome summer and fall time fishery. So, you, if you got on this because you saw it in an email and you registered, you have my information, my number listed. That's my cell phone, call or text, um, or email me, email or text. You're going to get a quicker response, phone call. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, I'll answer the question if I got it. Otherwise, I'm going to point you to the person or in the direction that you need to go to get the answers that you're looking for. Um, but please reach out. You know, we can only do these so many times year after year on the same species. So we're always looking for things that people are interested in. Um, so if you have a topic that you'd really like to see covered on one of these webinars, send me an email, send me a text. We'll make it happen. Um, these are tailored for you guys, for this audience. So we appreciate you being here. Best of luck. It's the best time of year to get out on the water coming up here in the next couple of weeks. So get out there, enjoy it, be safe. Anything we can do to help, feel free to reach out. Um, and until next time, tight lines, have fun, stay safe. We'll see you next time.